So welcome everyone to the third session of the Food Systems Track of the Beth Virtual Series. Today we will explore agriculture value chain upgrading and, and again we have an incredible and diverse group uh, to discuss. So to welcome you, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Rana Gonem. She is the chief of SE at Unido. Hi, Rana. Hi. <laughs> welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so welcome everyone also on my behalf for this session of the VEF virtual series. This is the third in a series that we have launched in October uh, that is looking at the nexus of energy and food systems. And the purpose of this series is actually twofolded. Uh, on one side, we are actually looking at uh, developing um, a set of policy briefs that help us in identifying the common challenges, opportunities, and also develop some recommendations for actions in key uh, priority countries that we would like to target under a global program, uh, which seeks to uh, bring together these topics of the nexus uh, closer. Uh, and so for this purpose, we launched the virtual uh, series across three tracks. And uh, today uh, we have with us uh, a session that will explore the role of sustainable energy and innovation in driving value chain upgrading and uh, we know that it is actually critical access to energy modern energy and energy services is critical in helping in value chain upgrading in the agricultural uh, value chain, uh, be it for uh, transport and uh, purposes, uh, be it for uh, refrigeration and cooling, uh, or also for packaging and, and, and processing. So access to energy is critical, uh, and also uh, particularly in Africa, where we see that there's quite a lot of development that still needs to happen, uh, and where uh, access to energy can really help countries with their development pathways. Uh, to help us in setting the scene today, uh, we have invited uh, uh, Mirain uh, uh, Havinga, uh, and uh, he's an expert on sustainable energy that works with uh, SNV uh, in Kenya. And uh, Mirain was going to be sharing with us um, uh, the findings of a report uh, that uh, they have developed in cooperation with colleagues in NDEV uh, on the opportunities for uh, productive uses of energy across the value chain. Um, so with that, I would just like to welcome uh, Mirin and uh, uh, ask him to start sharing uh, his insights. So welcome. Thank you very much, Rana. Very happy to join this session and I hope to uh, provide some useful insights, uh, as was mentioned by Rana, based on the NDEF learning and innovation uh, agenda uh, on productive use of energy. So I'm just waiting for the slides to appear. Great. All right, so um, we can already go to the next slide. And I would like to provide you some background um, <clears throat> on productive use of energy in general. So we know that productive use of energy is not a new concept. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but it's receiving more attention and it's now considered to be a main priority for energy access. And there's now a number of factors that actually influence this because we see increased rural energy access, the uh, introduction of payment models like pay go we see increased innovation and also a push for more commercially viable uh, models that actually require more energy use. So key barriers like affordability, appropriateness of technologies and lack of viable business models prevent PUE from scaling. And uh, in general, in the market, we see a lot of projects focused on market research, R&D, early stage grant financing and piloting business cases. And these initiatives, they show the potential and the importance of PUE, but the next step is to develop approaches that actually allow it to move to scale. So it's, um, a broad definition of PUE is energy that increases income or productivity, but actually there's a lot of varieties and details that can be added into this definition. Next slide, please. So looking at uh, PUE in agricultural value chains, this is a critical sector because agriculture is driving the economy for many developing countries. It provides livelihoods for 2.5 billion people. And the use of uh, the productive use of energy allows to increase food supply 
and also decrease food insecurity. Energy can be used to intensify production and increase income by mechanizing the operation and also to add value to crops. So there's opportunities in the different parts of the value chain. So production, post-harvest, processing, distribution, even waste to energy. An example of activities with energy input are drying, cooling, pressing, husking, heating, but there's a lot more examples. So IFC estimates the total addressable market in sub-Saharan Africa for PUE in agriculture to be around 11 billion US dollars. So that's actually a big market opportunity. But this is also very heavily dependent on affordability. In terms of technologies, we see solar powered irrigation as the most mature technology. And this is followed by cooling and also by solar agro process. Next slide. So as mentioned, uh, energizing developments, uh, for those who are not aware, a multi-donor partnership to support access to modern energy. Um, but now also we launched the NDEF Learning and Innovation Agenda, which uh, aims to enhance the diffusion of knowledge and take up new successful approaches uh, among four different teams and productive use is one of them. So the community of practice on productive use of energy is led by SMV. And we've analyzed a variety of PUE promotion projects through a project mapping and interviews. So the input for the report was provided by six NDEF implementing organizations, uh, which you can see below, or the logos are mentioned. So although, although this report is focused on PUE as a whole, I will go into some specific findings with relation to agricultural value chains. So one of the outcomes of the report is a project categorization. While agriculture can be promoted through any uh, each of these categories, uh, I will discuss two cases from uh, agriculture-focused projects, uh, one with a value chain approach and the other one with uh, PUE as one element in a broader approach. Next slide, please. So the first case is NDEF in Bolivia, which is an energy access project that was implemented uh, in 2005, or starting 2005, up to now. So initially the project focused on energy access through solar systems and other energy sources, but it transitioned also to introduce and promote productive use of energy, when they realized there was actually high demand from farmers that could really improve their operation through the adoption of these technologies. So the success of their approach was that they were flexible in providing tailor-made technical assistance and subsidy to entrepreneurs that wanted to integrate agricultural technologies into their farming business. So this has led to uh, a variety of impacts, uh, one of them being food security. And an example for that is uh, transforming a local water supply system uh, through the adoption of solar powered uh, submersible pumps which uh, created a much more tr trustworthy system, as well as agricultural diversification. An example is uh, growing new crops through being less dependent on rain-fed agriculture and adopting solar irrigation technologies. Another example is increased yields. And this is linked to the picture that you can see on the right side. By adopting a carrot washing machine, that actually led to a very interesting commercial business case uh, for a family that adopted multiple washing machines and set up a whole business around it, which created a market transformation and other businesses were stepping in this market as well. So a challenge is that this project is product focused and not value chain centered. And it's based on the direct needs of entrepreneurs. So it's like a holistic perspective of market transformation through productive use of energy. Another challenge is that entrepreneurs need continued support after the adoption of these technologies to maximize the productive uses, which was not uh, part of the design of this project. Next slide, please. So another case is the project Climate Resilient Agriculture for Tomorrow, which is implemented by SMV since 2019 in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. So this project is adopting a value chain approach, which is assessing energy needs, as well as the potential for efficiency increase, increase in each component of the value chain through the process, which can see on the right side. 
A success of this approach is that it uses a wider perspective and integrates more opportunities within one value chain through the development of business cases in partnership with the private sector. So the challenge is still finding appropriate and commercially viable solutions in the markets uh, of this project and business cases that are actually commercially viable. Also, affordability continues to be a main issue for the end consumer and also because there wasn't a specific component focused on access to finance in the project design. Next slide, please. So these examples show that there's not yet a silver bullet for promoting productive uses and agricultural value chains, and that there are a range of factors that must be considered in order to come to more, more scalable market impact. So within this uh, research and report, we came up with an ecosystem approach, and this is actually meant to provide a basis to design more scalable models. So just to briefly go through the model, on the left side, you see enabling market growth. So this uh, includes the development of quality standards and testing procedures for appropriate technologies. It also entails the design of policies and regulations to stimulate market growth, and then specifically for agricultural technologies. And the development of frameworks to really measure the impact of these, the adoption of these technologies. So this is work that can be done by uh, lobby groups, by testing organizations, but also sector associations. So in the middle, you see stimulating demand, and these are typical market development programs. So these projects should include some key components. Um, first of all, being a detailed analysis for the demand in specific value chains, and also an assessment of the availability of solutions in the market. It needs to ensure an integrated approach that combines looking at distribution, at finance, at awareness raising, in uh, partnership with local organizations. So after the adoption of a product, continued support to farmers will help realize a sustainable increase in productivity. And finally, monitoring with tailored indicators and uh, the, um, mobile based tools will help to measure improved crop diversity, increased yields and food security in the long term. On the right side, you see increasing supply and this uh, focuses around research and development, which is done by companies as well as institutions to improve the technologies and design by grants and business development support to drive innovation from manufacturers by consumer and business case research by more specialized institutions um, to close the loop between r d and market scaling and finally access to finance through seed funding and loans uh, will help to scale up successful business models next slide please so this is a very short explanation of the ecosystem approach, uh, but we also, uh, I would like to present a few concrete uh, recommendations next to this, this approach. Uh, first of all, being increasing stakeholder coordination across the board. And so PUE and agricultural value chains requires a cross-sectoral collaboration between both agriculture and energy research institutions, R&D labs, companies and development partners. Also, most projects are now designed from an energy perspective, but increasingly projects should be designed uh, from a nexus perspective from the start and include a variety of agriculture and energy experts, as well as people with a more technical and market development background. The third one is sensitization on PUE in the development sector. So it's important to create a better understanding of the complexity of promoting productive uses in agriculture among donors, financiers, and development partners. So they can make better decisions about the needed interventions. Finally, projects designed at scaling. So I have two examples. First one being um, a consortium that includes a research institution, a company, an R&D lab, and a development partner, and really allow to test business cases in an iterative way. Another example is a phased financing approach 
where you start by providing R&D grants, catalyzing the successful business cases, and providing result-based financing to scale up um, the companies when they enter the market. So this is a very short overview and uh, more conclusions and recommendations uh, will be published in a report uh, which will come out early uh, next year. I thank you very much for your time. Back to Rana. Thank you so much, uh, Marin. And actually, we a lot of what you said resonates very well with us. Uh, we've also been implementing projects promoting productive uses in uh, Africa and Asia. And a lot of the findings that you shared uh, resonate quite well with the study that we have uh, done. And I can't agree more on the issues also related to scale, but also speed now, uh, considering the time we still have uh, and the clock ticking for us to achieve um, the SDGs. So. Uh, your presentation was very helpful now for us to move into the uh, uh, breakout sessions. So for those of you that are uh, joining us uh, here for the first time, the way that uh, the discussions here are going to be structured is uh, that we're going to go into uh, four uh, breakout sessions. So uh, at the end, you can just go uh, to the side and then uh, move to the room. So we have the discussions focused around uh, four themes, uh, global perspectives, and there uh, we have uh, uh, the moderator, William, um, Brent from uh, Power for All, uh, and uh, he will be joined with a number of experts in the area to give us more discussion around global perspectives. Uh, then uh, in the second group, we have country voices. There we have uh, actually Miss Monica from ECRI, who's going to be moderating the discussion. Uh, then we have Enablers for Progress, moderated by Mark Prake, uh, our colleague at UNIDO, who has had a lot of experience on this productive uh, use dimension. And then finally, we have the session looking at uh, data uh, and uh, evidence as well. So you can pick which session. Uh, the topic is always the same. It's just that we're trying to capture uh, dimensions that are uh, different in each of these cases. So you can uh, go to the uh, side and join. Uh, so get out of the plenary and join uh, whichever one of the discussions you would like. And perhaps just for you to know, we've also opened up the networking space. So at the end of the session, after uh, the, all the presentations and discussions, we would uh, then uh, go uh, and you can network with other experts. For now, I wish you all a good discussion and start making your ways to the uh, back to the uh, breakout sessions. Thank you. Well, um, everyone, hi. I'm just going to go ahead and get started with this. Uh, my name is is William Brent. I'm the Chief Campaign Officer uh, for Power for All. Uh, if you want to learn more about Power for All, you can visit powerforall.org, which explains what we do. I won't take up your time doing that. Uh, we just heard from Rain uh, from SNV. Uh, we also have uh, a number of other experts here uh, in our session. I'm not going to get into detailed, ex you know, sort of introductions to everybody. Um, I think their bios were shared or are being shared by the organizers, but just a quick introduction, uh, maybe name and affiliation uh, from each of the participants to start out, and then we can get into the the, uh, the discussion. So maybe Huda, can I start with you? Sure, absolutely. Hi, hi, William. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for Great. having me. So um, I work with an entity called Selco Foundation. We have been doing, uh, you're working at the Energy Livelihood Nexus now for a while, you know, close to, I think, 10 years now. So a lot of learnings and a lot to share, but we basically, uh, you know, very similar to what was uh, presented in the beginning. Uh, we work along the value chain and essentially we look at where energy can play a, lo uh, can play a role and, uh, you know, impact livelihoods and reduce drudgery. And we work on a combination of factors. Uh, you know, one aspect is technology, finance, training and capacity building, unlocking local policies. Uh, so diff a range of different uh, inputs that need to come in so that we can create these enabling conditions so that there's local uh, development of solutions, there's local adoption of solutions. So we work uh, around that nexus. Thanks. Thank you, Huda. Great to see you. Uh, Juliette uh, from SMAP, can you also give a quick intro? 
Hi everyone, I'm Juliette uh, from uh, the World Bank uh, SMAP uh, in the Electricity Access Team. SMAP has launched a new initiative on improving livelihoods and human capitals a few months ago. And the, the, the main idea is really to mainstream demand simulation into operations uh, and, and, and do it at scale. Uh, so we, we've been uh, launching uh, this initiative in, in a few countries, and, and now we are building uh, our pipeline. Thank you. Thanks, Juliette. Great to see you. And uh, the two folks I don't know in this group are Frederick and Johannes. So Frederick, you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Frederick Oberthu here. I'm a senior planning officer at uh, GIZ. Um, responsible for uh, the value chain development approach of GIZ Value Links, and basically our tasks involve the planning uh, evaluation of our projects, including yeah, agricultural development, the use of productive energy in those. Great, thanks, Frederick. And last, uh, since Moraine, you've already introduced yourself. Uh, the last in this group is Johannes. Go ahead, Johannes. Okay, hi, my name is Johannes Bergmeier. I'm based in, in Vienna. I'm the general secretary of the WPO, the World Packaging Organization, which is also running here from, from Vienna head offices. Yeah, to be true, feeling a little bit as, as an outlaw in that group, yeah, because I'm a packaging technologist. Yeah, and for sure, we need a lot of energy for this, but uh, let's see where the discussion is taking us. Yeah, well, you're, you're welcome, Johannes. We'll figure some, some way to get you into the conversation. So I think we're a pretty good mix of, Absolutely. yeah, I think we're a pretty good mix of uh, energy and agriculture. Um, for those who are in the session with us, if you want to identify yourselves in the chat, that would be fantastic, just so we know who else is here. Uh, if you have comments, questions, you know, I think w in terms of my approach to this discussion, I really want to um, make this interactive as possible. Um, so, you know, there's no ne necessity for each of the speakers to answer every question that we're supposed to be addressing. Uh, at the end of this session, I will then report back to the plenary about some of the conclusions that we have come to. Uh, so that's the end goal of this, of this uh, session is to actually come up with some answers to the three questions that we've been given. But again, uh, please do identify yourselves um and let us know who you are where you're from and if you have comments questions for the group here that you see or you have perspectives that you want to contribute um we would love to uh to to hear from all of you um so just for the record there are three questions that we are tasked with answering uh from this group on global perspectives number one which countries offer the best examples of how to introduce value chain upgrading using sustainable energy, and that's value chain in the food systems. Uh, number two, what strategies were employed to make this work? And then number three, how can international organizations work together to create a suitable enabling environment for the introduction of sustainable energy to support value chain upgrading? So those are the, the questions that we're tasked with. Um, Moraine, you gave a couple of examples to, to kick us off in the plenary. Uh, Ecuador, I think, and Kenya, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so that was good food for thought. But I'd like to maybe just uh, start, Huda, with you, since you're our one country uh, representative here from India. And India has done so much work on productive use and livelihoods uh, as it relates to agriculture. I'm wondering if, if you can't uh, offer some initial thoughts on you know, whether you think India is the best example, um, or if you even think that we can define best examples at the country level, and wh or whether we need to go to project level, state level, you know, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, uh, William. So, uh, you know, India is, is, is many countries in one country. So I think definitely country level examples is a, is a bad way to go with. But like typology level examples is something that I would go with. You know, like say, for example, a millet value chain where you have millet farmers, which are 0 0.5 to 3 acre owner ownership and, you know, maybe mountainous terrains in a certain climate change, you know, that's the kind of typology uh, I would really pick uh, cases from, you know, because that's where you can actually have the maximum uh, cross learning and the maximum kind of potential to really look at replicability because, you know, I can capture a minute value chain 
in an in an area in South Karnataka, which is the area where I'm currently based out. Of, but it would be totally irrelevant for like uh, East India or even for certain North Indian states. You know, the same crop typology and the same socioeconomic status. Uh, but I do think, you know, capturing these typology-wise value chains uh, makes a lot of sense, specifically from an end user and a, and a farm and a farm ownership kind of a perspective. Coming to value, and quite a bit of work on it over the years and, uh, you know, both agri and allied value chains and, you know, looking at the pre-harvest, harvest and the post-harvest and the, you know, that, that entire value chain, uh, right from the seed and the land and the inputs, right, the fertilizer, seed, land, that input section is also pretty, um, you know, there are different opportunities to your, you know, on-farm kind of opportunities, your harvesters, transplanters, your deed eaters, sprayers, uh, you know, those kind of solutions. And then, of course, you have a range of different post-harvests which bring a lot of opportunities. Uh, but when it comes to value chains, we've realized, you know, three different opportunities that energy can really catalyze uh, by looking at the value chain approach. Um, one aspect is, you know, you, you look at different nodal points within the value chains or different, uh, you know, phases within the value chain. And you can really look at what is already mechanized and what is already kind of, you know, having certain amount of machinery and energy driven opportunity related to it. And that's the easiest part to look at. And I think that's a no-brainer. That's what, you know, we should be looking at. And that's easier to kind of impact because there's already a lot of diesel utilization, a lot of kerosene and petrol utilization across this value chain, right? So that's one level of opportunity that we see. So just to give you an example, if you look at the millet value chain, you can probably, you know, power the DV door, you can power the, uh, you know, millet grader, you can do those things. The second level of opportunity that we see is, is a little more difficult than the first, where you actually don't have mechanization for that typology at all. Uh, you know, there, it's actually been done manually a lot of times, depending on the farm acreage. You have only very heavy and very high, uh, you know, uh, energy consumption power till tillers and land levelers and not really for certain typology of farmers, right? That's where I feel the energy sector can really catalyze a lot of technology innovation, energy efficiency innovation, you know, which is not really as easy as modifying and repurposing, but you do need to really push uh, technologies which can be sustainable energy driven and efficient to to be invented and to be developed for these segments and there is a as, as there is a fair amount of gap there especially in the pre-harvest and harvest may not be as much in the post-harvest because post-harvest a lot of time is centralized right um, so that's the second opportunity that we see there and the third opportunity is probably more difficult than the first and the second but really i think the 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 kind of value of you know marrying these energy and agri nexus would really come in there is where you can really look at diversifying and transforming value chains so just to give you a couple of examples here uh, you know if you're able to make processing a lot more decentralized and accessible, it can actually add a lot more value to the farmer or the rural entrepreneur and need not be done at such a centralized level. You know, so, so really kind of decentralizing certain nodal points where you're actually, you know, both the input and the output section can add value. Like a farmer that's doing right now just harvesting, he can start doing seeds and nursery also. He can also start doing some level of sorting and grading as well, right? So that's really, I think, the potential to transform the value chain. And another example of that is also because agri is so seasonal, energy systems need to be used for multiple solutions. Like if I'm a chili farmer, I'm also growing turmeric, I'm actually going to enter, I mean, my recommendation would be not just to do processing for chili, but you need to find the other applications that you can intercrop with and use energy for both, right? So those potentials are, are uh, a little more challenging, which require, uh, you know, more kind of insights into, but I'll, I'll stop there and I'll come back to it. Thanks. Thanks, Huda. Uh, I mean, I think you've done our work for us. We can uh, we can end this session now. Uh, well done. Just kidding. Um, so, uh, but no, excellent uh, input. Um, I'm wondering if just a quick follow up there. If you have uh, ex quick uh, success studies or examples of, of that strategy working uh, in a specific area or a specific for a specific crop. Uh, through your work. Yeah. yeah. So there or, are uh, five main value chains where this has worked well, uh, in part or in full. Uh, one of them is rice, uh, millet, spices, primarily chili and turmeric. 
uh, potato and tomato. In fact, the potato tomato work is a lot uh, with GIZ and GIC completely with them. So there's an overlap there. <laughs> I just heard someone from GIZ. So all of it was with GIZ and GIC in the in the Karnataka belt. So yeah. Great, thanks, Huda. So, Juliet, um, you mentioned. I mean, you're an international work for an international development bank. Um, you mentioned that you're you're working at the country level uh, as well. I'm wondering if uh, if you have a, a similar perspective. I mean, obviously, I would love to get different perspectives from this group and from the the listeners as well. I would love to have uh, some difference of opinion so that we can actually really draw out some some tough issues that we need to answer. Um, so Juliet, if, if you if you have some things that you agree with that Huda just mentioned, fantastic. But I, I guess I'm more interested in in where your perspective might differ uh, related to the first two questions around countries that offer good examples, as well as strategies that uh, that might be deployed. Yeah, thank you, thank you, William. So I would bring the, the electrification uh, perspective. Perhaps we have we've seen interesting examples through World Bank finance operations, for instance, in Bangladesh or Myanmar, where productive use of electricity and opportunities to really develop uh, value chain have been included at the very beginning of. Uh, electrification pro projects, and that's definitely a key success uh, factor. And in these countries and at different scales, um, the rural electrification agencies have really taken ownership on the topic, building capacity, raising awareness uh, among all stakeholders uh, and along the, the entire uh, value chains. So that's two interesting examples. Uh, I can also cite Mexico on post harvest processing where the government has really implemented a large-scale program to foster the, the use and adoption of um, renewable energy and, and energy efficiency uh, technologies and, and targeting uh, specific uh, technologies such, such as uh, solar panels, uh, solar thermal and energy efficient technologies uh, like uh, efficient uh, milk chillers uh, among uh, others. But what we also see in, in some countries is, um, is that the private sector is actually uh, driving that uh, value chain upgrading rather than, uh, I mean, perhaps with the support of the international community, but it's really uh, private uh, driven. I'm thinking about Kenya on solar irrigation or Rwanda for, for coal storage. Um, and by offering innovative business model and very comprehensive uh, packages, which support the development of the whole value chain from farm activities to market opportunities and market uh, development. And, and this has been, of course, mainly driven by technology's maturity. So we've, we've, uh, we've, we've talked about solar irrigation, um, which is uh, most ready to scale. Solar refrigeration and cooling appliances uh, are still relatively expensive, but the business case is uh, it's sensitive to, to units um, utilization and then processing activities. I mean, perhaps a little less mature and, and um, in terms of application, I'm thinking of milling, uh, threshing, grating, etc. Um, so just on uh, very quickly on, on strategies, uh, the identification of champions within the project implementation, within the, the electrification agencies, uh, the implementation units is definitely key. Raising awareness, uh, this aspect of stakeholders' engagement uh, throughout the project cycle uh, will definitely um, be very important. And, and perhaps going beyond clean energy technologies and going beyond um, the energy access barriers and kind of address the agricultural sector constraint uh, about uh, agronomic training, um, the resources of farmers to expand their operation, I mean, tackling those issues. Uh, and sometimes energy teams are not always uh, uh, skilled for, for, to, to address those. So it requires, as I mean, we've been repeating that, repeating that for years, uh, but it's kind of hard to implement uh, working beyond silos and, and cooperating, uh, I mean, uh, foster the cooperation between uh, sectors. I'll stop here. Thank you, William. 
Yeah, thanks, Juliette. I mean, just a quick uh, follow up. So just so I understand the, the, the point. So you, the, the last thing you mentioned was around addressing agricultural constraints. You know, one of the things that I've found is that uh, many of the organizations from the energy side are, are very just, uh, I don't know, they have blinders on uh, oftentimes, and they're thinking purely from the supply side um, and this provision of energy as opposed to, you know, what is it that the farmer actually needs? Uh, so they're, they're a, a solution looking for a problem as opposed to, a, a, you know, a, a problem that, that, that's having a solution targeted to it specifically. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, in the example of, of Bangladesh and Myanmar, whether it sounds like you had it sort of integrated this electrification piece into the, the planning from the beginning, but was that, was that also done in partnership and close alignment with uh, rural development agencies and agriculture ministries and other water uh, people who oversee water was there was there that level of integration in the work should that be part should that should and if not should it have been part of the strategy yeah definitely i mean that should be that should be part of the strategy and it's it's uh for because of administrative and and structural um reasons it's it's not uh, it's not uh, happening i mean I, I fully agree on the fact that we've been focusing on supply and kind of overlooking uh, impact and and uh, and results um of of, of the solu of the energy solution that that we've been um, de deploying um the, the 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 collaboration ideally of course uh, would be at a ministry level or uh, i mean at this level but what we see at, uh, at the project level is that it can also happen very locally and that's um, that's perhaps the the, the, the first step uh, and and a more easy easier step uh, to take uh, to make it happen uh, at a province uh, provincial level or at a city level or village level um, to, to make it um, to make it happen. Great. And then one last question, just sort of as an organization, uh, I'm curious if you're willing to talk about the, the level of cooperation within the bank between the energy team and the agriculture team, both at the headquarters level as well as at the country level. So it's getting better, I would say. I mean, it's uh... It's uh, of course a real challenge. Um, it's uh, to me, it's, it's really a matter of uh, en uh, engaging the dialogue and uh, communicating. Make sure that teams are aware of um, of what the others are doing, uh, and then because uh, on paper we have to make that happen, and it's it's more a matter of uh, knowing the right people and ensuring that uh, everyone is on the same page in terms of uh, information. So I think that uh, now the teams, the agriculture, the water, and uh, the, the energy teams are aware of this issue, and that they are aware that we need uh, to to move this uh, topic forward, and uh, and and people are getting uh, interested and, and motivated to to really um, mainstream that that approach. Okay, so are are you having beers with your agriculture team colleagues yet? <laughs> Virtually. <laughs> Uh, virtually yeah okay good uh thanks thanks juliette that's great um so um i want to turn to frederick uh moraine and, and johannes to see uh whether you the three of you have something that you want to add to this uh, whether you know you you on the countries that you think are successful that we can point to uh as well as strategies that uh you think might have helped get to that success also as a reminder to the 21 people here, besides the seven of us that you're seeing, or six of us that you're seeing, we, we really encourage you to identify yourselves in the chat um, and also to ask any, uh, you know, make any comments or ask any questions that you have there. Frederick, uh, Moraine, and Johannes, anyone want to come in? I mean, perhaps one comment that I have regarding the selection of countries. I was uh, sent this discussion paper, paper for this uh, VEF uh, process where countries were categorized according to this category one priority countries, second phase countries, and currently constrained countries. 
And uh, the impression I got from that discussion paper was that there's a kind of linear thinking that you go through the steps, so to speak, uh, in order to become this priority country where uh, energy interventions would have the maximum impact. I don't know now if this is meant as a kind of selection criteria. Let's focus on priority countries first and yeah, wait for the others to develop so that they can also become part of the game. In which case I would be a bit critical of that approach because I could imagine that especially countries in conflict areas or fragile countries uh, might have specific energy needs which require also specific uh, solutions adapted to their context. And uh, in that case, I would say, okay, perhaps don't look always for the best examples, also look for the difficult ones uh, to make sure that these people are not left out. And the second one, I would like to second what Juliette has been saying in terms of um, strategies that uh, the private sector, um, in my view, should be in the driving seat, so to speak, if we want to achieve scale. Um, from my project experience, if you have a business case, if a farmer, if a salesman of solar units or whatever sees he can make money or she can make money with a given solution, then they will make sure that everything is in place, happens so that they can uh, proceed with their business. And I would see it as our role as uh, development organizations to facilitate that process, but not to carry it forward, if you see what I mean. We should, as far as possible, avoid subsidies but minimize risks into the entry and to market entry. Because in the end, you want a solution that can be carried by the, the value added in a given value chain. If I buy an irrigation pump, for instance, I must earn enough money uh, in what I'm producing to make sure that I can maintain it and that once it's broken, it has to be replaced. I have the money to buy that replacement and I'm not depending, dependent on a project uh, to give me that money. So when it comes to scale in the end, I would say really, if you have the private sector in the driving seat, that's your surest way to achieve that. Thanks. Um, that's great, Frederick. Thanks. So um, just so I understand when you, you're talking about so making sure that uh, there are risk mitigation, financial mechanisms in place that avoid sort of market distortions, but encourage mm -hmm. the private sector, is that correct? Yeah, just, that just an example from a project I was working in, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, what we had there was a kind of leasing scheme where basically the, the private investor investing in the value chain was allowed to lease his equipment, uh, drying equipment in that case, for plums. Um, and as profits were coming in, he could pay back, so to speak, but always had in the back of his mind that, okay, this is a, if equipment is not a freebie I got from a donor, but it's something I have full responsibility for. I have to make sure that I generate the money to purchase it and maintain it. And market disclosure, yeah, it's, it's an issue. Um, of course, if you come with these uh, kind of schemes, microfinance institutions uh, might get some competition. To be honest, I haven't found a solution to that yet, um, but uh, it's something that has to be considered, yes. Okay, thank you, Frederick. Uh, Moraine, Johannes, anything more you'd like to add here? Yes, I think I can add something. Um... Very interesting <laughs> discussion. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, Moraine, go ahead. No, no, hey, Moraine, Mar hey, Moraine, since, since sure. you've already had your a little bit of time to speak. Let's let, let Johannes go first. Johannes, come on in. No, no problem. I also can't go last. What I want, interesting discussion, yeah, really. You know, I'm, I'm seeing myself a little bit as, as outlaw here in this round because I'm not directly dedicated to that energy question. I'm coming from a packaging organization, yeah? World Packaging Organization. And for sure, we are running also together with UNIDO worldwide projects yeah, in, in, in our field of, of, of knowledge technology about packaging. And what I want to bring in is that I think what we need here and what we learned in many, many projects around the world, and this is also why I don't want to highlight one country or region or whatever, it's, it, it's more about the project we can learn of. And what we have seen, the most important thing is that we have a holistic approach. Yeah? And this is what I like that much about that supply chain approach, yeah? that we really, it makes no sense that if we, if we want to, to improve a situation, yeah? in, in our case, energy consumption or, or energy com production delivery, it makes not sense to, to focus just on one 
part of the supply chain or one process or one step of the thing, we have to see the big picture. Yeah, because this is where I can bring in my, my packaging experience because many people in our case, don't see what packaging in such supply chains, and if we're talking about agricultural supply chain, food supply chain, yeah, or related supply chains, then for sure packaging is a sidekick. <laughs> uh, I know it's about producing crops, growing crops, and producing meat or dairy products or uh, uh, meals or whatever. Yeah, and I know from such projects that in, on the very last meters they come up with the idea, okay, ah, oh, yeah, true, we have to pack it somehow because we have to. Deliver delivered it somewhere on the market. Yeah? Uh, and if you don't have the right knowledge then to do this correctly, yeah, you can make a lot of mistakes because if you don't see that even such a sidekick like packaging yeah, is, um, is, is plays a virtual part because you can lose a lot of energy there. Yeah? And this is, this is not only, or, or you can save a lot of energy energy in your in your, in your supply chain production, yeah, because it's not that much about uh, which packaging material and how much energy we are we are putting into the packaging material, yeah. Although it would be very interesting to discuss about this, yeah, where is it possible to uh, to go on glass solutions because you need a lot of energy to produce glass, yeah, or on metal solution because you need a lot of energy. Uh, uh, for metals, yeah, it's much easier to run in that case with plastics, yeah. Also, nobody at the moment likes plastic, yeah, because we have that big environmental discussion about plastics in the ocean. But if you see it from an energy perspective, uh, then sometimes it's the only solution. And what, but what we forget normally, yeah, because we are now at the moment in my in in in, in my field of application packaging, we are so focused on that recycling and material discussion that we forget about the energy discussion. Yeah? <laughs> we, we need that input. What is the energy balance of our systems? Yeah? At the moment, we are just talking about recycling. And this is, this is good and it's a precious discussion and we need it worldwide. Yeah? But what we're losing out of sight is the energy discussion, because what is not recognized very detailed at the moment is the protection function of packaging. If we talk about the, the agricultural supply chain, yeah, sometimes by the packaging system or the combination between the food processing system and the packaging system, we decide how much energy we put into such a supply chain. Yeah. Uh, as an example, a dried product uh, needs another uh, energy, has a, another energy balance than a deep frozen product, yeah? Because to keep a, a, a product deep frozen, you need a lot of energy, yeah? And so maybe by investing in some packaging technologies like active packaging, intelligent packaging, smart packaging with oxygen scavengers or some humidity uh, uh, regulating things or whatever. Maybe you put a little bit more effort or energy into packaging, but you save a lot of energy in your food supply chain. Yeah? And this approach and the knowledge for it, yeah, this is missing. And this is what we have seen to be true worldwide. Yeah? And our projects in Africa, in Asia, in Mongolia and whatever, what we need is, is knowledge and is training yeah, mm. on, on these issues. This is my, my, my input. My head. Thank you, Johannes. That's great. Uh, it's interesting to hear a different perspective. So much appreciated. Uh, Maureen, go ahead. Yes, hello. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it makes sense. And makes sense. I think packaging is definitely also something um, that we see. And I'm talking from the perspective from East Africa because I'm based in Nairobi. Um, there's multiple components in the value chain, which are key. And mm -hmm. I think there's now a lot more focus on this holistic perspective. And maybe from our experience in SMV, so we started sort of adopting this more uh, energy needs assessments uh, for any value chain. And because we're also doing a lot of work in agriculture, so there's a lot of potential to link up with agricultural programs. Mm -hmm. And now um, we're actually in the next year together with NDEF launching an, a new program, which is focused on specific value chains in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. So that's the dairy and horticulture uh, value chain. And I think with that approach, you can really sort of try to understand for those specific value change, chains, what are the, the viable business cases. 
so for example, uh, for the dairy value chain, um, even solar water pumping can be used for, for livestock. And I think it's some of the solar water pump, uh, pumping companies, the majority of their sales is going to feeding livestock. I think that's also an interesting insight. Um, and also given sort of the relative maturity of solar water pumping and cooling in East Africa, I see a lot more applications. Um, also in horticulture, in drying, um, and sort of making use of that maturity and further build, building skill in those specific value chains uh, offers a lot of potential. Um, maybe talking a little bit about the companies, and I think that's an interesting point. So there's a lot of um, energy companies which are providing solar home systems. And especially in Kenya, this is a very mature market. There's over 30 companies providing solar home systems uh, with pay go payments. And now they're looking at, okay, so should we also go into this, this agricultural space trying and they're, they're launching and they're testing products. But what was already said, like this has shown to be a big challenge because it's not only uh, providing a product, it's really understanding what specific farmers need. And there's a lot of variety of farmers, a lot of variety of value chains. And if you don't understand your customer, uh, it will be very difficult to sell the product. So I see in the market a lot of more specialized startups entering the market, but they have the challenge. They don't have enough funds to really do the R&D. Um, and I think the gap is larger multinational companies who have the ability to invest in R&D, really seeking the opportunity to introduce more standardized and scalable technologies in the market. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, um, it raises a, an interesting question about the role of big business in, a, in, a, in an environment where there's, I think, a lot of allergic reaction to trying to consolidate more food production within large corporations. Um, so I don't know if that's a strategy that I necessarily would ag agree with, or if others on this this panel would, um, but it's certainly a, it's a it's definitely a, a, a one pathway. Uh, so any other thoughts on that? But I think also you sort of raised the question for me anyway. I think everybody would agree that the private sector plays a critical role in all of this, um, with the right financial incentives to do so that don't distort the market. But are those companies energy companies or are they agriculture companies because you know there are already a lot of companies out there that are serving uh, smallholder farmers and farming collectives um and you know they're they're they except for maybe irrigation they don't have from my, at least my experience they don't have the the understanding of the uh, uh or they, they don't believe that these solutions are viable right now for their for their clients, right? Uh, and and I, you, Maureen, you mentioned the IFC Pulse Report statistic of eleven billion dollar, you know, addressable market. But the serviceable market, uh, based on that same report, is seven hundred million. So of eleven billion dollars, the only the only amount of that that we can serve is about seven hundred million. And and the the main barrier, as you noted, is uh, inability to pay, right? I mean, we're talking about a, a client base, a, a smallholder farmer that can't af that can't afford much, right? They're 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 making very difficult decisions about how to spend a very small amount of money, uh, and energy doesn't you know usually come to the top of that list, uh, or if it does, you know, it, so so I guess my question is, as a strategy for entering these markets or building these markets. Should this again be something that's led by the agricultural sector and the people who serve those last mile customers, or should it be led by the energy companies that are trying to serve the same the same customer? Who wants to chime in on that? Well, uh, if I could ask an additional question, because I come from the agricultural sector, not some of the energy sector. And um, one question I have, if I take the example of a micro hydropower plant, is uh, how much standardization do you really need for that? 
isn't it possible? When I was thinking about the, the, the private sector, I was more thinking of the small entrepreneur uh, in the provincial town who is able to sell these microhydropower plants to the smallholder farmers, not a big company providing a tried and tested uniform uh, power plant to, to the masses. Is that, uh, let's say, a pathway that can be followed? Uh, are these technologies that are easily replicable adoptable by a local entrepreneur and then uh, sold to, to their client base around the town? Or is it only something you think that big companies can provide? I mean, I would definitely tend for the first option. I would definitely prefer that one. But, uh... Yeah, Frederick, thanks. Let's put that question on hold. If others have thoughts on that, I'd be here, interested to hear them. But Huda, I think you wanted yeah, yeah. to jump in. Thanks, Please. thanks, William. And I can maybe also just touch up on what Friedrich was asking as well. So I had a, a couple of like where with the areas where we are finding it uh, easier to apply the agri energy nexus is where you have some level of structure existing, good level of markets existing. So whether you whether there are whether there are private agri businesses working there, which is very very few. Uh, you know, or their, you know, farmer producer groups and cooperatives which are there, or their sort of self-help groups and, and joint liability groups that are there. So when you have that that basic infrastructure, it, it's a little bit more easier and possible to kind of, you know, showcase and demonstrate and really, you know, have impact with the agri-energy nexus. Uh, but in places where, you know, those that's not existing, it's really, really hard. I mean, so in those places, you really need to get a lot of the knowledge, awareness and capacity building done on agri itself you know let alone energy because energy is only a catalyst or an input right that's not going to be the the end game right so but one of the things that we do see uh, what we've been trying to create and we have been creating is sort of hubs for people to come and get trained on the agri energy nexus so whether it's dairy in fact we actually had a the SNV team of dairy visit some of the dairy clusters where we have the complete sort of value chain uh, development but that training is not just on the equipment and the energy. It's also on the market linkage, on the produce. On, I mean, it's, it's basically the end-to-end, -end, the inputs, the outputs. So because you need that basic things from an agriculture perspective to then layer, uh, you know, energy on. I definitely don't think uh, private is going to be in the driving seat anytime in the near future, you know, because most of these, uh, you know, it just, and there's so many middlemen in the process, right? There are commission agents, there are traders, there are middlemen. And I, by the time you want to, you know, do something for that last mile farmer, there's too much of a disconnect between a private company, at least the larger ones that are procuring. The smaller mm. ones that are startup and social enterprises are still working, but they're too few, right? Uh, but private is needed very much. I think private, public, philanthropy, all of it is needed for what we're trying to do in a big, big way. I do feel the role that philanthropy plays can be very critical in catalyzing the roles of both public and private. Uh, there are three aspects where we've seen this to be most effective, either where you have the creation and development of financial and business models. So like if you're talking about threshers or you're talking about dehuskers or any of them, right? A lot of time government or private will not pick it up until it's a proven viable model or there is a level of creditworthiness that you build, right? So in that sort of early stage typology building, creditworthiness building, sort of building those models out, that's where I feel philanthropy can play a big role. Second is, of course, on gap finance and de-risking, similar to what, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, what was being said in terms of really providing that gap finance and de-risking mechanisms for both for financial institutes and for private companies to really invest a lot more. And the third is really on infrastructure support. So a lot of things that we discussed, I actually feel like they might never be viable from a project level perspective, but from a generational perspective, country level, it's like financing roads or financing bridges, right? Like pure infrastructure, like large milling centers, uh, you know, common facility centers, uh, paper use centers, like those kind of common infrastructure for poorer areas. Uh, those would have to be capital subsidized. Of course, operationally, they may, you know, they would work really well and, you know, but it depends on the, uh, you know, like the context and the complexity. But that's where I see philanthropy, those three places which can really catalyze uh, what's being said. And, you know, uh, I do feel like agri companies would, would, would be the drivers and then energy could just be a good plug-in, uh, you know, a good catalyst for them, essentially. We can't hear you. Can't hear you. So yeah, I just see a, <clears throat> a note from the organizers that we have about minutes left. 
Uh, we haven't talked um, much about the, the third question that we've been tasked with, which is how international organizations can work together to create a suitable enabling environment uh, for the introduction of these, um, these types of solutions. So I wanna spend a few minutes We've got SNB, we've got the World Bank here, uh, GIZ as well. I mean, you all work internationally. Uh, thoughts on that? I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I'm gonna turn it over to the panelists first to, to hear your ears. Who would like to, to start? Juliet? Moran? I can, I can. Yeah, go ahead. I can yeah, yeah, please, go ahead. Um, so it's very multidimensional issue, as we've uh, noted, um, and um, and uh, what I've uh, what I've done uh, in depth so far with this knowledge exchange uh, platform, I think it's a critical first step uh, to make sure we have uh, we all know what's uh, going on and. Um, so that's really at the international level, but that, uh, then at the country level, the donors coordination, um, uh, of course, with uh, close collaboration with the, the government, uh, is really. I mean, it seems uh, it seems uh, very basic, but it's sometimes not happening uh, on a very regular basis. Um, perhaps energy teams among donors are talking to each other, but definitely it's not uh, cross-sectoral and, and this dialogue is, is not happening. Um, so those, those would be the, the first step really to then envisage more joint uh, operations and um, joint uh, efforts. Um, yeah. Thank you. Who else? Yeah, I think in addition to what I presented um, from this research, I think, and also like we, uh, what uh, Juliette mentioned, we have this group of around 40, 50 people. Some of you are also part of it, um, where we just start with exchanging about, okay, what's happening? What are you doing? Uh, what kind of approaches are there already? Uh, because from the analysis, I think, like a lot of the projects that are now being designed, they actually include everything. So they also have an innovation fund, they also do R&D, uh, they also provide financing, et cetera. So, which is actually not needed because there's a lot more specialized initiatives. For example, the Efficiency for Access Coalition in class who are focusing on, on uh, quality standards and uh, R&D grants, et cetera. Um, uh, there's a lot of work on, on sort of measuring uh, impacts on productive use uh, from specific technologies. So starting with at least better coordinating at, at a design level. So if you design a new project, then you say, okay, we're going to outsource the part for R&D because there's a lot of initiatives who can tell us which technologies are mature. And then there's a lot of, another partner that has a lot of local presence. Uh, agricultural cooperatives and organizations who have a widespread network of farmers. So they're going to promote this technology. Like, I think that that's really a starting point, so, sort of being aware of, of what's happening and who's there and how you can collaborate with. That's great, Moraine. Frederick, Frederick I'm, happy, I'm guessing you have something to add here as well. Yeah, not much really. Perhaps what I could add is this, uh, yeah, knowing what's going on in the sense that if I'm implementing a project on the ground, it's always useful to know which solutions have already been applied elsewhere and have been work, uh, been working there. And in that sense, a collaboration like Endev, I find it very useful because there you have a kind of go-to point where if you have a specific problem in the value chain you're promoting, you could see, okay, what has been done? Who could I contact to see uh, how they've been doing it? tap into their knowledge and maybe adapt as a solution in my own context as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Johannes, anything else you wanted to add there? No, no. Absolutely. Just can back up what, what everybody said before. Yeah, Marine, yes, totally agree. Don't make it too big. Don't make it too complicated. Uh, be open to focus on that things you really can do Yeah, and search. Be open for partners uh, who can do other things better than yourself yeah and and frederick yes be open for for best practices yeah don't don't estimate that you have to invent everything for new every time yeah uh, watch out also for for different area sectors maybe 
not no thinking in the, in the first time that it that there are parallels but you can learn from so many projects so be open for for other people's experience yeah, yeah. that's it yeah. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I would just uh, maybe add one thought here based on our, our work in Uganda. Um, you know, what, what we found is that very everybody's got their own program, their own initiative. Everybody's responsible for measuring and evaluating their own program and initiative. And that's, you know, sort of fundamentally reduces the chances of collaboration uh, and working together because everybody's got their, their head down working on their own project. And very rarely is there an entity that's that's supported to actually do coordination. Um, we've been lucky enough to receive some some uh, foundation support uh, to actually create national level platforms, which bring all of these various stakeholders together: the public sector, the private sector, civil society, uh, donors, etc., and actually. Um, or, you know, tr work work with them, or put more, you know, uh, bluntly to force them into identifying what the barriers are to scale, uh, and then working as a group and building consensus within that group to uh, address those those barriers uh, and try to remove them. So, I would say that you know it sort of builds on what Juliet you were saying and what what all of us I think have been saying that um you know there's just a, a much greater need for uh exchange of information across the board you know uh and sharing of that information uh you know to enable joint action and align and alignment um so yeah i think we're unfortunately out of time i think this has been a great conversation thank you all um i hope uh we get to continue this conversation down the road you're all doing amazing work uh, and yeah, time to go back to the plenary. Thank you, thank, thank you, you all very much. All right, so let's start. We have about 45 minutes, and I'd like to start by welcoming everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and thanks for joining this session on um, Country Voices. As we heard at the plenary session, um, the idea of this virtual consultation is for us to get strategies that work so that coming next year, 2021, during the VET, we can present some of these lessons and success stories and use them to implement strategies for promoting economic recovery for the food systems uh, area. Now, um, for those of you listening, I'm sure many of you know that uh, COVID-19 restrictions really affected the agricultural supply chain. And in Africa, it, it was very severe. So in Africa, we know that uh, the agricultural sector employs about 65% of people and contributes to about 75% of domestic trade. However, with this COVID, we had people who were vulnerable being affected, and women especially, considered that women are you know, very active throughout the value chain in uh, the agricultural sector, whether it's in the processing, production, or even marketing. So hopefully we'll be hearing from our experts you know, lessons that have been learned, success stories, and how some of this can be directed towards strengthening um, our economic recovery in the food systems very soon. So I have with me very uh, a collection of very experienced experts. And um, if you would like to you know, get their bio in detail, I invite you to check the, the website. However, I'll just introduce them briefly. And we have uh, today Sofia Martinez, who is a senior policy officer at the EU Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development. We also have Jean-Francois, who is a, an agro-industrial expert with UNIDO. Uh, with us today is also David Butler, who is, uh, he leads the Sustainable Food Systems Island. And we have again, um, Ayane Abawa. I, Ayane is an advisor at the Ethiopian Ministry for Trade and Industry. Finally, we have Julius Mujini, who is the country manager of um, 
an NGO in Uganda. So let's start with the first question. And this question is uh, for Jean Francois and Ayane. Tell us what energy interventions and technologies present the most significant transformational opportunities to support value chain upgrading. Uh, but first, let's start with what we mean by value chain upgrading. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, I think effectively there is uh, different uh, different ways to understand the value chain uh, interventions. And there is factors that need to orient our intervention uh, based on typical analysis. Um, despite the different existing approach, we can consider uh, the actors, the products, the economic aspects, the market structure, the governance and the linkages, and the resources. But of course, we are uh, working within a development uh, strategy. And in, in UNIDO, we are working mainly um, within the agro-industry value chain interventions to orient uh, our action for inclusive and sustainable agro-industry development. So having said this, the, at enterprise I'm level, monitor, the typical... Is it just me or is everybody just unable to hear anything? I can hear. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. So probably we can give some minutes to fix the problem. Or I just continue. Oh, please continue. Okay. So at the enterprise level, um, if we consider uh, the different strategies, we can talk about the product upgrading, the process upgrading, the functional upgrading, the sectoral upgrading. Within all these intervention, um, we can talk about sustainable energy or the use of bioenergy. So for example, for product uh, upgrading, it's very important for the development and the commercialization of product with improved performance characteristics. And there um, we use frequently solar tunnel drying systems for grains or solar dryers for finished products. Uh, for the process of grading, so this is the development and implementation of new or significantly improved production or delivery methods. Um, we used solar powered, powered sorry, cold storage facilities um, with the use of better insulation as well, of or evaporative cooling in subtropical area for fruit and vegetable. We also can use for cooking uh, biofuel or solar. Um, for hot water, for sure, it's the solar solution or the biofuel from time to time or biogas as well and the water pumps for the irrigation. For the functional upgrading, we can say that it's engaging a new or superior activities in the value chain. So for example, when a firm moves from component manufacturing to product design, but there, um, what is really important is the communication uh, aspects via internet that makes it available thanks to solar energy to more people. Uh, for sectoral upgrading, um, when it's about moving to new productive activities or sector using previously acquired knowledge and skills, uh, evaporating cooling devices for the transport of fruit and vegetable might be very efficient as well. So this is what I'm thinking about the enterprise level, but all this without uh, service or support uh, structure upgrading, it's very reduced because we need to have um, all these aspects uh, covering uh, machinery, equipment, customer services, uh, certification, technical assistance, um, and everything. So I don't know if I made myself clear. I think you've uh, given us very detailed points to consider. I like that very much. Uh, I would like to invite Ayane to just to contribute to what you've said. I don't know, if, um, let me repeat the question if, if needed. Uh, the question is, um, what energy interventions and technologies present the most significant transformational opportunities? Now, I would like you to emphasize on 
what is uh, significant, what is a significant transformational opportunity, you know, building on, on what Jean Francois has said. Actually, you know, I want to comment before that, you know, before, you know, selecting a technology. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? So yes, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. technologies in, in 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 energy technology. You know, I want to comment that you know currently what we need in our integrated agroindustrial park. Currently, we are you know building the integrated agroindustrial parks in Ethiopia to just integrate the supply and the demand side of the the food chain. So currently, we have you know uh, we are trying to you know uh, create favorable condition for increased investment in agro processing. So around the integrated agro-industrial parts, we have uh, transition markets called rural transformation centers, which are built within 10 hectare area. Within these rural transformation sectors, we have a, a, a huge uh, uh, cold storage, bulk storage, vegetable storage, we have honey storage, we have wax storage. So, so far, we don't know how to operationalize this one, you know, we have built the facility. But, uh, you know, so far we have not used, you know, the we have not operationalized them because you know we were waiting for the consultants from Unido. You know this project is a Unido support project, so we don't have the proper support you know to operationalize these arrangements. But we see that you know we have a lot of a lot of opportunities to use the productive use of this energy in these rural transformation centers. Uh, we can use this huge uh, cold storages and vegetable storages can use this renewable energy. Uh, regarding you know the technology you know the most uh, transitional way of you know producing energy is cogeneration you know Ethiopia is greatly endowed with agricultural uh, products you know you know Ethiopia is one of the few countries uh, which has a huge agricultural development potential you know there is a huge a huge potential to commercialize Ethiopia's agriculture but the current problem in our agriculture is you know there is poor technology penetration in agri our agriculture you know where you know using uh, our supply-driven agriculture fragmented. So we need to introduce this agriculture by co-generating co energy from this agricultural uh, leftovers from agricultural crops, you know. Uh, in the parks, you know, currently we have, you know, have a lot of uh, agro-food processing industries. These processing industries are, you know, producing a lot of solid waste. So we can generate, you know, uh, power from this solid waste and we can reuse it. So, so Cogeneration is you know, the one technology that we, we, we prefer for this uh, transformational use of energy. This is my comment on this point. Thank you. It looks like the moderator vanished. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope she will be back soon. It might be. <laughs> this is the beauty of uh, virtual meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Here you are again. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, sorry, I left you when you were talking about the Anyale, the you know wonderful work you've done with the with the pack, the integrated agro processing pack. However, some of the technologies, you know, like the the gold, um, the cold uh, chain, are not being used. Could you could you continue on what you were saying? Then? We know we, we don't have the proper consultation to operationalize these rural transformation centers. We have currently built the facilities, you know. We have, we have uh, you know, finalized 95 percent. You know, if you if you may have the progress report from UNIDO, Ethiopia has you know constructed these parts, rural transformation centers. You know, our the status of our construction is nearly 95 percent. We have huge vegetable and fruit storage facilities. We have huge honey storage facilities, milk storage facilities, but we don't operationalize them so far, you know. So we can use, you know, the product energy can be, you know, an opportunity here, you know, if you have the proper guidance from our consultants, you know. We were, you know, attracting consultants from Unido, but uh, due to COVID, you know, we are not able to get these uh, consultants for the last seven, eight months. Yeah, it's so difficult for us to travel for the moment. So I can, definitely. I can definitely. tell you, definitely. So regarding technology selection, you know, we have, we are, we are planning and we have uh, a lot of food processing industries who generate a lot of waste, you know. So energy can be generated from that waste and can be used at the same time that in that rural transformation center in the parks. 
So there is a huge opportunity, but it needs, you know, uh, proper assessment of the demand. It needs to, you know, proper assessment uh, of, you know, its profitability. It's, you know, it, 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 it may be optional for, you know, to attract an investor, you know. We are attracting, you know, investors in the food processing sector. Also, we can attract an investor in this energy supply, you know. Energy supply in Ethiopia is, you know, based on the government, you know. Actually, Ethiopia produces more than 95 percent of you know renewable energy from hydropower and you may have heard that Ethiopia is currently building the big uh, hydroelectric power in Africa you know and certain is, uh, is uh, the one is equivalent to yeah. Hanover in America yeah so the government is trying to supply you know uh, energy to the rural yeah. area but so far you may have that 60 percent of our population is rely on using yeah. energy for productive purpose they don't have light they don't have you no know, light, they are in darkness. So there is a huge opportunity, a huge as market, you know. How to yeah, make this demand effective, you know, it, it requires we'll work. Come back to the challenges. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come back to the challenges. You're actually ahead of us um, in terms of the questions. Okay. Let's I think we've touched on very, very important points. And you know, as John Francois said, the, the opportunities are there across the value chain, whether from product down to structural. So let's look at now, you know, the impacts this may have on gender equity. You know, when I started, I mentioned that we do have a lot of women involved across the value chain in the agricultural sector. And Ayala, you did mention that sometimes we have these great facilities, but they are not working. So let's um, take a look at examples where this may have worked and how this has um, uh, equity. Uh, Julius, I would like to invite you to, to touch on that point. Sophia will be coming to you next after Julius. Sophia, I think Julius is having some issues, so why don't you step in? Okay, sure, no problem. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. I think this is uh, resonating in, in my mind key issues uh, related with the important role of agriculture and energy. And I've just came from, from another discussion on access to energy and how we need to go beyond the light bulb to productive uses, because this is something that is fundamental for, for Africa and for, for development of Africa, but not from this development perspective um, and come from development cooperation, but we really have to go beyond. Between Africa and Europe, we launched uh, in 2018 the Africa-Europe Partnership. Uh, to, in reality, to go beyond this, uh, we are partners, we are neighbors, we 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 want uh, the same objectives, which is uh, sustainable development for for all. And for the European Union, uh, gender equality is fundamental. It is in our DNA. We have a gender action plan. And we mainstream, meaning integrate gender considerations in all our programs. We just launched uh, the third action plan to reinforce what we're doing. Obviously, it's not enough. It's always more to, to be done. But I could mention a couple of good examples that we put in place uh, for specifically for sustainable energy. Uh, we launched uh, within one of our flagship initiatives called Electrify, that you probably know. Uh, focusing on on renewable energy for for medium small size uh, projects supporting supporting this type of investments, and and we had a specific uh, project for empowering women uh, on energy, but for 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 jobs for for being part of of the process. Not just uh, sometimes when we talk about women and and energy, we focus on clean cooking, and of course it's important. But uh, women do much more than than cooking, and it's uh, this transformational change that it's uh, it's important. It's a it's an interesting and successful program in different uh, parts of the world with different uh, implementers, and it's a, it's a good example. And then uh, there is also um, some activities within our flagship initiative on climate change, the Global Climate Change Alliance, including agricultural projects, energy projects, water projects, bringing the nexuses, where uh, special attention is always paid to, to the role of women trying to empower uh, their the, the role within the communities and, and be also to become leaders uh, as part of, of this transformational change that, that is needed. 
think that I don't know if I can also give some figures on on the general quality part uh, in in GCCA, which is quite uh, quite important when you look at the effort that we have done. It's uh, one of the actions where gender is uh, constantly. Um, pay attention and 40% of the programs contribute greatly to, to gender equality. So it's, uh, it's not easy. You have to put the resources in place. It's also capacity building. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's making the change. Of course, it's not going to happen one day for the other. I think that capacity building is it's fundamental and, and assist uh, and cooperate in, in this regard with all the stakeholders. Governments are important, but then the civil society, society is also very, very important and part of, of the question. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Um, Julius, welcome back. I hope you heard some of the things Sophia said, uh, because we would like you to build on that. I also would like to tie back to, you know, the value chain of grading that uh, Ron Passwa talked about, like product, process, you know, structural. From your experience, how have you seen you know, integrating sustainable energy technologies throughout this change, or even one, for example, how have you seen it contribute to improving gender equity? Uh, thank you, Monica. I was having some connectivity changes. Yeah, so um, one example I would give maybe in Uganda is that um, uh, maybe just to give you a, sh a bit of background. So in, in Uganda, and I believe in most sub-Saharan countries, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, you have this uh, historical, cultural, you know, issues uh, surrounding, for example, around things like when a, uh, when a man has children, let's say boys and girls, and he passes on, who inherits um, the land he has left behind? Historically, uh, women, especially in this country, uh, have not had the opportunity to, for example, be recognized as heirs to their fathers. And so the, many of them lack access to rights to, you know, own land because of that historical um, imbalance. And um, what this means is that, for example, if a financial institution would like to maybe develop a product, a loan product that is going to, for example, let's say help women have access to solar irrigation systems. So you'll find that in many of these financial institutions in Uganda, uh, their lending methodology, their approaches still require traditional collateral like land. So in a situation like this, you'll realize that many women are left out, that it's not just uh, an issue of whether their technologies are available on the market or not, but how can women actually be able to have access to these technologies, uh, given the fact that we also know that uh, the majority of women in most sub-Saharan African countries are actually employed in the agriculture sector. So for me, uh, particularly, I'm thinking, you know, you need to not only uh, address the issue of, of, um, of, you know, availability of these technologies, but also most importantly, how, to, how can we ensure that access is equitable? Like, is it possible for men and women to have the same opportunities to have access to these technologies? Uh, given also the, uh, in another fact that, you know, uh, the, the high upfront costs are not just only for entry level products, like the ones uh, Sophia was mentioning for lighting uh, and, and maybe cooking, but you can imagine this could become even a, this is a much bigger problem when you're talking about uh, technologies for productive use. You touch on very important points. Again, you we've talked about challenges, and I think everybody's itching to go into challenges, so we'll go into challenges right away. And um, my question is for David. David, uh, what are the main challenges to the adoption of sustainable energy enabled value chain upgrading at a large scale? Um, Julius talked a little bit about it, you know, mixing gender and cultural barriers. So let's hear from you. Thank you, Monica. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and I speak here as, as a, I suppose, a food systems specialist rather than an energy specialist. I leave the energy uh, specializations to, to my colleagues. I think, I mean, the key challenges here are around, uh, and if we think, we, we, we've mentioned Africa a few times, so, so, so let's focus on Africa. Uh, I, I think the key challenges are around the scale of the informal sector. So huge amounts of food that is produced, the output of families and, 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 and smallholder farm families in Africa never goes through formal markets. It never goes through formal channels. It's, it's traded, it's, it's, it's uh, intermediaries, intermediaries, traders, and so on, often are offering better prices uh, for, 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 for output. They're, they're, they're available and they're immediate to the farm gate. So as opposed to working with what are still fairly fragmented processing sectors and fairly sometimes disorganized processing sectors, it's often easier for the farmer to deal directly uh, uh, and, 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 tr and trade uh, outside of formal markets. So that's an enormous issue in terms of delivering through the value chains innovations and improvements when you're trying to, um, when, when aggregation an organization is really important in terms of uptake of new technologies or in terms of sharing innovations or getting the most out of infrastructural investments like an ally was, was talking about with the agro parks and and and, and so so there's a, there's a disconnect there so that, that that thing about i think the informal markets is very is very substantial um food losses and food waste mean we are are, are losing a huge amount of the output uh, and, and energy intensity, therefore, in the remaining output is higher. Uh, so addressing food losses and food waste, so pre-harvest, post-harvest, and related to that then energy use, obviously, in, in terms of uh, uh, smart energy storage, in terms of coal chains, and in terms of distribution um, is extremely important. Thirdly, I would say, um, and I think this, this is in terms of solutions, um, integrated thinking more 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 um, coordination collaboration um, I mean nobody was ever sacked nobody was ever fired for saying we need better coordination and communication but that's the reality that's the truth in food systems we have multiple stakeholders we have multiple interests we the key to upgrading value chains and food systems is about getting the best of the combination of public private and civil society, unlocking the potential through their partnerships. And it's it's difficult to do. And everybody tries to, everybody has strategic plans and planning process and processes and so on. But too often uh, they're, they're fine in formulation, but they're weak in implementation. And so when you have more holistic thinking and more systems thinking, it gives you a chance to figure out what potentially are the obstacles that will block our uh, uh, amplification of, of new technologies, new innovations, better skills, better management, and so on. And this is relevant across for smallholders, mid-size, for large scales, for the role of women, for the role of youth, for developing agri-enterprises. It's that they, they're all hindered by the, 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 the issues that arise from a lack of joined up thinking. And that, that then results in things like perverse incentives, like subsidy schemes that are um, that badly designed or that, that, that end up being um, badly used and so on. Um, uh, you, you know, a whole, whole variety thing of things you can think about where, um, w w w you know, they, they in themselves are well designed, perhaps are well intentioned, but they don't fit within a system. And so you lose, optim you, you lose optimization. And that's, those are, those for me are, 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 big, are big challenges. Um, you know, there's also trade-offs. So energy, uh, uh, I mean, the more we process food, the more energy we use. Um, making cheese, cheese is, is, is about 10 times, has 10 times the energy intensity to make cheese compared to liquid milk. And there aren't 10 times the amount of calories in cheese compared to milk. So you have a trade-off. So you have you, you must be able to, to get your, your, your return, the return and the value add. It must be possible. So therefore, this must be market driven. It must be driven by what, what your consumers will buy, what your markets want, where your market is going. Um, so, so these are some of the, 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 the there are other trade-offs then in terms of environmental issues, in terms of 
com competing uses of, of byproducts, for instance. I mean, it's easy to talk about bioenergy, but the byproducts of, of, of food and agricultural production previously were used to feed animals or they were used for um, for household heating or, or, or whatever. You know, you you, you do have, the, the answers aren't simple. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, thanks. Yeah. I, can um, I, can I just, I'm very happy to talk about coordination. Yes, you will be coming in. <laughs> you will be coming in. But I would like you to build on, on what Niamh you were saying because you already started talking about challenges. So uh, David talked about coordination, you know, integration, and just you know putting together these small dispersed farmers to increase volume and investment. I think that was what Ethiopia tried to do or is doing with the integrated uh, path, agro-processing path, by having smallholder farmers all coming together into one place. But however, you talked about these wonderful facilities that we're not using. Okay, so this is a challenge. I think the, 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 the project took about $10 million and it started since 2016, if you can confirm. So, like, in one minute, discuss again the challenges relating to actually adopting such sustainable uh, technologies at a large scale. Then I would like John Francois to come in, especially as you're a UNIDO staff, it would be good for you to also reply to what um, Ayala said. No, I, thank you, um, because it's really, really important indeed. What I want to say is that it's it might be wonderful, it might be very efficient, uh, to build a new uh, cold storage facilities powered with solar energy. With... Ayane. Sorry. It's for me or? Oh, I th okay, yeah, just go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Go ahead, please, go ahead. I, I've already mentioned my, my concerns, you know, challenges, you know, that we are facing. So let me hear from you and, you know, Mr. And Benda... we change, yeah? Then we can exchange a bit, yeah? Okay, okay. No, what I said is that it's it's wonderful to have it and uh, within your park and the, all the other agro park that we are uh, planning and we are making uh, feasibility studies. Um, it has to be also uh, backed uh, by intervention uh, in other ways at growing level, at harvest level and post harvest uh, level, but also at marketing and the research for the debouché. Otherwise we get stuck, like you said, it's not working. So please, Ayele. Actually, I just share what Mr. David has said. You know, uh, this uh, you know productive use of energy requires coordination. You know, coordination. As a country, we have a universal access to energy. You know, we have a ministry called Ministry of Water and Irrigation and Electricity. You know, we have Ethiopian Electric Power Supply. So we have a national uh, uh, access to power plan. But the, the challenge is how to attain that plan, how to attain that target. So there is, there is a need for coordination, you know. Currently, we have created, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, this uh, a coordination structure, you know, by making a national steering committee for the project at the prime minister office, you know. The prime minister office macroeconomic advisor is, you know, chairing that, that coordination forum, you know. We have a lot of people from Ethiopian Electric Power, we have a lot of people from Ethiopian Ministry of Finance. We have people from uh, Ethiopian Electric Authority. We have, you know, people from it Water Irrigation Ministry. You know, it requires coordination. You know, coordination of different people. You know, to 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 to, to make it operational. So currently, we have, we had, you know, we were successful to conduct that National String Project Committee at the Prime Minister Office. So far, we have conducted some three three big meetings. Uh, meetings and you know we are currently solving some of our big big problems. One is power issue for the parks. You know we have been liking we have been working with the Chinese companies. You know two years three years before you know to get the power supply for the integrated agro industrial parks. Even the parks. You know currently we are getting them some some money from the government so that Ethiopian Electric Power Authority can supply energy for these parks. But you know, around the integrated agro parks, we have uh, transitory markets called rural transformation centers, as I tell you. So this productive use of energy, the power generation can be used you know, from this agricultural byproduct there. So uh, coordination is really and research and, you know, research, you know, focusing on the people, you know, uh, bottom up approach, you know, is very, very mandatory, I think. 
Thank you. And Not first of all, I was... And that. Yeah. Sorry? Do you mind if I jump Not in on that just for a few seconds? Okay. Uh, John, first of all, I just wanted to make sure you had said what you... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's going uh, together with what David said and I only said is that just the intervention on sustainable energy, global picture without the communication and the link in between all the actors of the value chain, it's not working. We have to take yeah. care of that. And uh, the support of the uh, supply chain of the sustainable energy must be integrated into the value chain development. Well said. Julius, please go ahead. Sure. So I just wanted also to, um, you know, re like really emphasize on some of the points that have been mentioned by, by David uh, and the rest of the, you know, my colleagues here. So, you know, I, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, some of the disconnect that we see could potentially actually be addressed, you know, from the policy uh, side of things. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there's been reported uh, lack of innovation or, you know, the lack of use of certain technologies. For example, let's say uh, in the flower sector, where you see a lot of, uh, you know, wastage, um, you know, of the residues that are not being used, for example, to say, I don't know, generate energy uh, that could potentially be used at these flower farms. Uh, you know, there are opportunities like, is it possible to save and look into things like, uh, as a sector, let's say for flowers, uh, could they potentially uh, start thinking of things uh, like how are these flowers produced on these farms? Is it possible to use um, renewable energy uh, and then maybe position yourself to attract a premium for these uh, flowers as opposed to farms, for example, that don't use um, renewable energy? So. Uh, I believe some of these issues can potentially be addressed uh, from the policy side uh, to improve on the coordination and, and all these other sectors being able to work together. Um, unfortunately, I think we've lost Monica. Monica is gone again. Yeah. No, but for sure, all the policy aspects are really important and they need to be included. Uh, we were also talking about the financial aspects uh, to have really access to finance in order to be able to to implement the sustainable energy strategies and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Monica, you're back. We can't hear you. Monica, we don't hear you. Julius, could, can, can I jump in and take up your point about the, about the flower farms? I think yes. it's very interesting. Um, and, 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 you know, it's not easy. It's, it, it's, it's because, because consumers pay for, they pay based, they, they choose based on, often based on price and availability and, and, and things like environmental uh, criteria are often down the line, despite what they'll say. And despite the fact that we would all like to think that we buy based on, oh, wait, this is good for the environment. But the reality is that a lot of people make choices just based on much more driven by price. But what you're talking about here, I mean, one potential thing that we use quite a bit and that you see quite a bit, of course, is, is, is areas like voluntary certification schemes. And, and these, these, I think, are, are really interesting in terms of, of joining up some of the, issue, of the issues between uh, farm level, producer level processes and, and what governments want to incentivize without interfering directly with the market. So the ability to differentiate yourself based on your sustainability credentials, your use of water, your use of energy, your, your um, issues around biodiversity or, or other, other uh, environmental or sustainability impacts that can be assessed and certified is quite a powerful thing. Um, we use it in Ireland quite a bit, and um, it's 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 an, it's. I think you'll see a growing use of it in, in a variety of contexts, in terms of safety, in terms of sustainability, and so on. 
Uh, so, so I, I think there are there are, you know, second best solutions to some of the issues that 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 we have. We won't. We, we never. We may not find the perfect solution, but but we can find alternatives and ways of working around some of those things that help then deliver value to the to the to the producer and the and the processor in the chain. All right. So Absolutely. we're just yeah. Just one more question. We're about to round up. Um, Sophia, I'd like to call you. Could you tell us a little bit about how countries could address some of these challenges? You know, we've talked about policies and a lot about policies. So before we go to the audience now to receive their questions and comments, could you tell us how, you know, what are the strategies that work and what would you recommend for the challenges we discussed? Thank you. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's very relevant, especially for for us in the EU Commission, that now we are entering into our new multi-annual financial framework, which is uh, covering seven years, and we precisely work at country level, and we are going to work more at country level because uh, globally we can discuss the the issues are very similar, and and uh, David was saying that it's coming more from the agri perspective. I come more from the energy and climate perspective but the issues are very similar and and we have these pillars that we have to tackle but there are specificities for each country so it's each of you at country level in the case of ethiopia or uganda or uh, bangladesh is these specificities at country level where we really need to anchor what it is needed and, and to differentiate between the, the different actions. I think that it's also important the action even at local level. In some cases, the distribution of, of food, it's also very much the cities or, or other areas. And, and organized planning, allowing to access to energy also to the center and creating this, uh, these networks. But again, is the lack of infrastructure. And for that, this discussion at country level, having uh, integrated planning, come in and discuss with the utilities. The utilities, unfortunately, and, and we are seeing it now more and more with the crisis, they are not fit for purpose. Their the economic shit, it's, it's, it's going down, bankruptcies, there are many, many issues. So utilities can also make the difference. And we really need to work with them as well to, to create the strong utilities in Africa and elsewhere. To, to have a, a strong market integration for electricity, for water. There is the case also of bringing utilities uh, to, to manage water and electricity at the same time. It can be done also at the local level. And we have not really mentioned cities and, and local action, but they are very important stakeholders in the discussion. So at country level, you really need to have the dialogue with the national government, the different institutions, but the local actors, and of course the civil society, etc. So having these integrated dialogues and bringing all the different expertise. And I would like also to mention the, the role of digitalization. But again, we need energy access. Without energy access, we cannot get the, the gadgets to function. And it's also very important for the agri sector, even in the sense of, of uh, um, climate services. So it's, uh, again, a delicate, complex, very integrated approach that is needed, but the action has to be uh, ad hoc design with the relevant stakeholders. And this is something that from the EU, we are really uh, uh, focusing with, uh, in our dialogue with the different uh, partners. Thank you. Thanks, Sophia. Um, again, we are all talking about, you know, a more integrated approach to designing and you know, implementing actions on ground, thinking about the long term of our actions and how to make sure that, you know, whatever gaps are, you know, closed while we are designing our actions. So thanks very much. Um, I would like to call David, you know, again, to discuss um, some of these strategies, you know, you talked a little bit, you touched very much on them. So if you could um, share some light too, and um, we'll move to the, to the participants after that. Okay, can I, can I mention two things, Monica? And one follows on from Sophia's point uh, about, about the commission. Um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, an initiative that we're using a lot in Ireland in recent times is, is um, uh, your innovation partnerships, uh, so funded, supported partnerships, 
And in Ireland here, we, we, the emphasis tends to be on environmental issues, biodiversity issues in agriculture. Um, but these partnerships are very much driven from the ground up. They're very democratic. So groups of farmers or groups of people in a particular area get together. They get support in terms of they get some additional technical support, but and then they get some funding to carry out perhaps applied research, applied development, applied issues, looking at how their practices have an impact and, and can achieve certain objectives. And as I say, they, they, you choose the objectives um, depending on, on, on the, broad, the broad parameters, the broad criteria of the support. But it's a really interesting model, I think, in terms of locally driven ground up initiatives which, which you can fit within a, a coordinated kind of national approach because you're at the national level, you're setting your high level objectives and you're trying to focus your use of your resources towards their objectives, towards agreed objectives. But it's just, j j just following up from Sophia, I wanted to mention it specifically. I think it's really, it potentially got really huge applicability in, in, in developing country context as well, and, and particularly in, 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 in relation to agriculture, in relation to sustainable development, where you've got, you've got you know, particular uh, value chains, groups of producers, producer groups, cooperatives, or so on, and, and giving them the, the opportunity to drive their, their agendas within the bigger picture. So my second point then is about that bigger picture. And one of the things, again, that we try to emphasize is, um, the role of 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 um, facilitation of of strategic planning in a national context, which brings in, and I said it earlier, public, private, and civil society. So bringing together facilitated, in our case, government facilitates it, the, our Ministry for Agriculture, but it's driven by private sector, by farmers, farmers' representatives, industry uh, processors, researchers. They're all part of this process of looking out where we want to achieve what we want to do for the next 10 years but what we're going to do within the next five years and the really key thing about that is it's it's multiple stakeholders from multiple with different agendas it is people who compete with each other otherwise but fine they're putting that at, outside at the, at the door for the time being for the purpose of trying to achieve consensus on a shared vision so that that shared vision then drives how government spends its money, for instance, on, on applied research and development. So, so R&D was mentioned a few times. So how do you ensure that R&D isn't in ivory towers in universities and research centers? Well, part, part of the way is that you, 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 you use your public funds driven by this agenda, driven by this vision. So it has to, come, has to be towards this vision. And that's how you determine what, what you will use your public money for. Similarly, the stuff that the government agencies do, similarly, the design of, of things within universities or the links between universities and, and private sector and so on. Um, that's, a, that's a model which um, we've, we've worked a little bit with FAO on, on um, trying to explain this model or, 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 or support some countries. We've done a little bit of work in Uganda, actually, and in Rwanda. And the principle being that it is multi-stakeholder strategic planning in agri-food, um, it's 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 trying to achieve that, trying to gain that consensus and that that shared vision, uh, and then other things flow from that. So that's that's much as I wanted to say for the moment. Monica. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. You talked very much about system change, especially you know through the multi-stakeholder uh, stakeholder approach. So let's go now to what our participants have said. Jean Francois, this is for you. Uh, um, Ade DG would like to hear from you about research, what UNIDO is doing in the area of research, in meeting the targeted goals towards food sustainability, and he would like you to talk about youth internship. I, I'm sorry, I didn't really hear your question. He wants you to talk about what UNIDO is doing in research. In research? On, yeah, yeah. Okay. In sustainability. No, UNIDO is very uh, into this agro park for the moment, uh, and they are making a lot of feasibility research, uh, combining this value chain uh, integration with green energy. And uh, this is really a key for the development 
of the countries because it's really linking uh, the people, it's forcing the integration. So it's also uh, improving uh, the value addition to the product. Of course, we, we do have problems. It's, it's a long-term strategy. And uh, so it's a lot of effort we are putting in for the moment to integrate that. And uh, about the, the internship, I don't know. There is an internship program. They have to register on the website if they are interested. And this is very clearly uh, detailed there. OK. Um, Olivia, you made a lot of comments on what the FAO is doing. And since you're here, why don't you talk, talk a little bit about them, the comments you've made? Talked about the synergies between the business case, you know, for energy companies and others. I asked to share my screen in case Monica would jump out. I would take over as moderator. So that's um, apologies for my invasion. But okay, just quickly, I think there's a what we what I mentioned there is a is a way to de-risk investments on in energy for food chains by do, giving this cost-benefit analysis, which look at environmental, social. Uh, uh, economic and financial aspects plus gender aspects. And we've used it for rice, uh, vegetables and milk in Tanzania, uh, Kenya, Tunisia and, uh, and, and uh, the Philippines. But because uh, you need to give um, information to de-risk these investments. And the second point I wanted to make, and I mentioned it, is that the, the energy companies, big ones, are very interested in the agribusiness sector, the agriculture sectors, because they want to invest in rural Africa. It's a big market for them, but rural people in Africa often cannot pay the cost of energy unless their business case, the farmer's business case, the small and medium agricultural companies improve their business case. So they sell better food, less food losses, better quality, more food. Then they can be in a better position to pay for the electricity. So I think one issue is that the Ministry of Agriculture doesn't talk enough to the Ministry of Energy. And my last point was about, and they, these don't talk enough to the Ministry of Health, because there are really very important synergies there. I think I, I don't have time to say more, but I mean, you can always contact me on these issues. Thanks very much. So let's return now to the plenary session. Thank you all for very uh, for your you know interventions and also for to the participants for being very active. So let's meet at the other side, the plenary. Bye. Um, first of all, welcome, uh, dear panelists. A uh, very warm welcome, and likewise to the to the audience. A bit weird because I don't see the audience, I don't hear the audience, but I know that they are there um, um what is this we we have 45 minutes to talk about enablers for progress and um what i intend to do is uh I, we have really an, an amazing um set of experiences here around the table and um I will, my plan is to give each of you the floor uh, at least. Hello, Hi, I'm there, very there sorry is for Alec the delay. Coming. Hi. The system got frozen all the time when I activated my camera. I don't know why, now it works. No, no problem. Happy to, to see you um, and welcome. I had just started really uh, 10 seconds ago. So um, I was explaining that we, we have 45 minutes and um, I will give each of you the floor at least twice, uh, I hope. Um, please uh, be in your interventions um, uh, so that we can have more rounds and maybe more interaction. Um, I will also, depending on the activity in the chat and depending on the time, uh, pick on what happens there uh, and use that to enrich uh, the discussion. Um, so that's sort of the, the rules of the game, um, and not not more to be said about that. Uh, then about the content, what 45 minutes, we're not going to solve everything, but what can we do? Uh, this whole topic is, uh, is multidimensional as a challenge, we all know that. 
what I would like to have as an ambition for this session is can we can we identify two or three key elements um, let's call them indeed enablers if we address those then maybe other things fall into place as well can we do that so sort of narrow it down to a few of what could be the most important uh, elements um, in in maximizing this potential uh, for agro value chain um, that's it for a quick introduction I have sort of a sequence of spe of, 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 of you panelists in mind I might change my mind depending on how how the communication goes uh, but my plan is to start in a second uh, with alexander and then followed uh, by by sarah um and so with that can i ask you alexander to sort of give your views on what it is that um if you were to start from scratch in a country in an economy what are the key elements the key features that we need um enabling uh, a, a thriving bio economy um please alexander the the floor is yours alexander hello oh can Alexander, do you hear me? No, I can't hear Mark. Can you hear oh. me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> do the others hear me? Sarah, Florent, John, I can you not? If you yes, hear me? yes, we okay. can. Okay. Ah, good. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I don't know when. I could hear um, you and see you very well when I tried to enter, and then everything was frozen all the time, and I had to wait okay and when i wrote Look. the text into the chat then i could enter but then the others left so um okay but good let to see me, you let... and meet you <laughs> do you hear me now alexander can you hear me no no you can't hear me look i'm going to, sh to i'm going to change tactics here um and um maybe alexander joins us later i'm going to to keep you waiting for a second Sarah if you don't mind and maybe ask Florent if I may um, if you're up for it to um, I mean I also know your GIZ FAO in the past um, what do you see as the key uh, elements uh, for a bioeconomy and agro value chains you share your your inputs on that please yeah sure um, so yeah so basically, for 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 us in uh, in GIZ and the project, uh, we are uh, looking at uh, mostly renewable access, energy access in uh, agricultural value chain. So we try to identify what are the key needs in terms of uh, energy needs, so being uh, heating needs or electricity needs, uh, mostly in agricultural value chain. And then to work with the the private sector, so being the um, uh, distributors, uh, productive use of energy appliances, to kind of support them to enter the market and to serve the, the farmers. Um, then, so that so that's the way we we look at the we look at it in the, in the program. I think there's for me there, there are two enablers for progress. I think, um, yeah, so in, in my former job, I was looking much more on food security and now much more on uh, renewable energy. And frankly speaking, I think you will not achieve food security by um, improving, like having more renewable energy in, in food value chain if you use market-based approaches. So I think you would need to start with these uh, commodities that bring uh, much more money than others. And I mean, that's that's the whole story of uh, solar water pumping. It, it's first for vegetables and then maybe move to the commodities. Um, so that's, that's one thing for me, but that's very personal. 
Then the second point, and that's I think there um, the end of program and, and yes, as much more experience to offer would be to use the um, the kind of uh, market activation me mechanisms that we've been developing for household energy into the uh, productive use of energy. So everything that is result-based financing where you have, um, let's say, um, a productive use uh, of energy, RBF, uh, for solar pumping, for uh, fridges, for milling, uh, these might be uh, tools that will be that would reduce the cost for of the technologies to farmers, and that would support uh, the, the deployment of, of technologies. And then the last point, sorry, now I have three. Uh, is I think awareness raising is quite important because we see, like in the renewable energy sector, being for solar home system, uh, also that it does matter to invest into um, behavior change campaigns and uh, raising awareness because i'm not sure that all farmers around the world knows about the what renewable energy can can offer um, in terms of productivity and income increase so yeah th these are for me are the three enablers for progress Thank you. Thank you, uh, Florent. Thanks a lot for this as, a, um, uh, as an introduction. Um, Sarah, sorry to have kept you waiting. Um, I, I'd like to, to, to move to you now uh, and, and maybe build on that, uh, given your experience in a New Energy Nexus. Um, does this does this make sense to you? Have, um, would we need another enabler here? Can you even if possible, um, use an example um, that that uh, from one of your uh, recent uh, experiences or country work, um, and 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 add your your insights to to what Florent just just mentioned. The floor is yours. Thank you. Sure, it might help with a little bit of context that New Energy Nexus is a global organization that supports clean energy entrepreneurs all around the world, not just with productive use, although a lot of our um, clean energy um, entrepreneurs, startups, a part of the value chain. So that could be electric vehicles. Um, it could be productive use. So we have some startups, for example, I'll share one in a chat actually, which is a Kenyan startup called Power Hive that our executive director, Danny Kennedy, who's an entrepreneur, a solo entrepreneur he's himself has helped um, establish and is a microgrid, um, but the microgrid, the company invests in, um, a chicken um, farm which creates income which pays for the energy. I'll share that in the chat in a minute. Um, but we see four key intervention points to help scale clean energy entrepreneurship um, with productive use but also with just clean energy support and that is by launching clean energy enterprises and we do that very much in a local capacity so we have programs um, all over the world it started in california but we have programs in uganda in indonesia vietnam thailand philippines china um, we we very much focus on a local locally driven approach um, we um, partner with universities with um, research labs um, and meet with entrepreneurs um, within the second approach is accelerating those through incubator or acceleration programs they can run up to six months um, we have a particular focus in india for example we've just secured some support to run a women in clean energy entrepreneurship program um, thirdly and i think a, an important one that florent mentioned as well is is funding these entrepreneurs and the startups that are um, coming up with innovations to 
um, productive use. So in Indonesia, for example, we have a $4 million fund that we invest directly in companies. In California, we also have a $24 million fund that we invest in, in companies, and that's through grants, but we also have investments um, into, into companies themselves. So investors can um, play an important role. And then in terms of scaling, new energy nexus, that's the fourth intervention. So in particular, we work with corporates. Um, for example, we've just run an EV and battery challenge with um, Hyundai and Kia, and we try and match make um, startups with corporates and, and also to do this globally. So I don't want to talk, to talk for too long, but there's some enablers and intervention points from the new energy nexus perspective. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Um, and I, I, I hope we can come back to some of the things that you said later in the discussion, like the entrepreneurship, like the, uh, the women um, dimension. Um, but let us now move to, uh, while Alexander is with us, let me see if uh, I can um, get Alexander in the discussion. Alexander, can you? I don't see you, but um, can you... Are you there? Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, I hope you, you can there? hear me. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, I can we see can you. hear you. Um, okay. Uh, other people see you as well, I see in the chat. <laughs> I don't see you, but that's not important. I can hear you. <laughs> that is essential. Okay. Um, going back to my initial discussion, we already had some inputs from uh, other panelists. Um, what I would like to hear from you, uh, is uh, in an ideal bioeconomy or uh, best use of um, the potential that uh, an, an, an agricultural value chain, chain can offer, um, what are the key elements that, that you see that uh, we need to take into account in this respect? Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. The all, um, please um, apologize. Uh, my problem here with the software it was frozen all the time, and then I could see Florent and John, and I thought I'm in the in the team, but then I wasn't. Um, so um, thanks for the fruitful exchange. Um, uh, so uh, we are working on food system transformation, and um, one important tool uh, in our research and development that ETH Zurich, uh, with our industry partner, is a holistic sustainability assessment because. Um, only then we can really compare. So I would also even challenge the term sustainable. What is sustainable? It can be maybe more sustainable than existing sources and benchmark. So we should always double check whether we go in the right direction. And that includes the full value chain of the product and services. That includes generation of the product service and also disposal. So when we, um, for example, want to change uh, energy supply, I think you know we should also then double check with sustainability assessment in all three dimensions not only the environment not only the co2 footprint also the economic and social environment uh, of um, sustainability whether that is really going in the right direction so that is one fundamental aspect and here we have a key challenge that we have a lack of methodology we can quantify the environmental sustainability from my point of view already quite well when we have the data available but uh, we have strong limits uh, with the social dimension of sustainability. And when it comes to food, that includes nutrition, health impacts, uh, you know, energy um, generation includes also uh, several uh, health uh, impact potentials, for example. And we should really address these aspects in the whole three-dimensional sustainability assessment. So that is one aspect which I think is quite important. And we have methodologies which can quantify already quite good um, certain um, dimensions, especially the environment and economic side, but we have a lack of methodology um, on the social side. And that includes also one important aspect of, from my point of view, many new solutions and innovations. We say it's more sustainable, but I think we believe in that because it has a potential to be more sustainable in the direct comparison. But then we have to also see the sustainability performance on one side, but also the total cost of production for the society on the other side. And um, especially in food, again, we have this speciality that we have a lot of indirect costs for our society when it comes to wrong nutrition. We have health impacts with wrong diets. Uh, or, um, we have uh, environmental damages of our food production, agricultural production, which are currently not visible in the price of a product. And we are talking here about um, 
for example, meat taxes, we are talking about sugar taxes. That's currently realistic scenarios. And um, in science, we are already a bit beyond that, um, where we try to also quantify the cost for environmental damage of a production or service. And I think that can bring up our um, innovations and solutions and current existing um, technologies to a fair comparison. And then we focus on specific um, innovations based on microalgae research uh, in the industry, where we collaborate a lot with our startup uh, um, ecosystem here, but also in Europe and um, in Asia and um, the uh, microalgae and insect um, industries. But that is, comes then really more specifically on, on the um, points maybe you mentioned, Mark. Well, thank you, Alexander, for, for this. Um, also very interesting uh, points, a uh, lack of certain methodology, at least for for the social dimension within sustainable uh, development. We, we might uh, throw that later into uh, the, the panel and, and see if, if, if there are real life experience to, uh, experiences to, to apply that to. Um, but let me, let, before we conclude this first round of, uh, of interventions, let me uh, give the floor uh, to John, um, I mean, John, we have already different uh, areas, uh, points here in the discussion. Um, I was going to ask you how about financing, how about funding, how big a bottleneck is that? Is that one of these enablers or not that we are trying to identify here? But since other people already briefly touched upon it, I give you the flexibility to either discuss the financing part or if you see a, a more pressing element, then please um, talk about that um, that as well. Um, you have you have flexibility in this. Please, John, the floor is Thanks, yours. Thanks, Mark. Um, and yeah, I think so. Uh, Reap as a as an organization is focusing primarily on financial instruments, um, and you know we're looking at specifically um, <clears throat> off grid and, and productive use of energy as sort of our main um, sectors. And for instance, right now, one of our largest programs that we're implementing is the Beyond the Grid Fund. And this is um, probably around $100 million uh, capitalized right now. This is a, a very large energy access program. It's pan-African um, and, and expanding. We're, we're uh, implementing this together with the Nordic Environment uh, finance company, NEFCO, and uh, we ran a pilot in Zambia uh, starting in 2016 and are now expanding. Uh, we've launched in Burkina Faso, Liberia, and Mozambique, and are uh, currently in uh, what's called market scoping in Uganda. Uh, and one of the things that we changed and that we learned from uh, the first kind of round of implementation in Zambia was that... Um, we weren't, we're, we weren't assigning enough value to the actual productive uh, use sector. So we have, there are actually um, uh, some instances of productive use that are being supported. And uh, just to walk this back, essentially the, the cornerstone of this whole program is a, is a results-based financing mechanism. Um, and in the first round, we were very much prioritizing uh, very kind of low tier energy services. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, um, if you're prioritizing this, uh, we do so in, in, by, by paying for it, right? And low tier energy services uh, are relatively uh, cheap uh, compared, to, um, compared to even low tier productive appliances. So uh, solar uh, irrigation pumps, even the cheapest ones, uh, you know, are upwards of 500 USD. And so with an equivalent, uh, per, you know, with an equivalent subsidy, uh, obviously you're going to be um, sort of getting more bang for your buck in the development space, if you will, uh, in, in the basis energy access. But we have kind of uh, created a new framework for building productive uh, energy into the next round. And part of this is by creating kind of booster uh, booster values for energy services that have these appliances attached to them. And by kind of fitting, uh, fitting the weight closer to uh, reflecting uh, a greater share of the actual cost of the system um, to farmers. 
And so I think the RBFs are certainly very important, uh, particularly in early stage markets. Um, but beyond that, one of the things that we're also focusing on quite uh, greatly is local financing. Um, there's virtually no local financing in uh, local debt financing in sub-Saharan Africa for um, for energy like clean energy projects. I mean, there is some. It's very scattered. Um, there's some in South Africa. There's some in East Africa, but um, this is a huge gap, and this is something we're working on now. Is is uh, setting up um, actually guarantee facilities that work with local financial institutions to invest specifically into some of these projects uh, and do so in local currency financing. And I think one case of this, and uh, I guess Fiona's not here, but um, you know, there's a there's an interesting business case for a company called Inspira Farms that builds cold storage uh, units. Um, and it's sort of a, uh, a, um, a turnkey uh, product that they offer. And they have a really great uh, financing uh, facility that they've arranged with SunFunder. Um, but it's really dependent on the currency of their clients, you know, of the income, the revenue of their clients being in hard currency. Um, and so, you know, they can sell to some agricultural uh, off takers, you know, flour producers who are then shipping to, to Europe or fruit producers who are shipping to, uh, you know, outside of the country uh, and where their revenues are in USD. But um, for companies that are looking at more, uh, that are serving the local market, they just don't have any of that access to, to the debt financing they need. The payback periods aren't very long. It's, a, it's, a, it's actually a pretty nice, pretty good business case. Um, but there's just, uh, you know, a lot of barriers in, in the financial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Um, thanks for this. And, and indeed, Fiona is coming in and out of the session. So let's move on. Um, well, how are we doing, I am asking myself, in uh, identifying some of the potentially key enablers. Uh, what I have heard so far is quite a lot of mentioning of um, market-based uh, activities, uh, result-based financing, uh, private sector participation. So that seems to be um, very important as a, as, as a, as a driving force. Um, I also do take note of, of Alexander's um questioning or posing the question what is sustainability are we clear on at least the social side maybe the most um, critical one to assess uh, due to a lack of methodologies and i would like to pick on that um and maybe uh, go back to you sarah in that respect i mean uh, entrepreneurship in clean energy is when when it works well is covering the economic dimension because it's creating new businesses creating jobs it's also if it is related to clean energy it's covering the environmental how about the social i, I know that you already mentioned uh, the uh, women and maybe youth um, so there is an important um, social dimension there could you elaborate on that maybe with an with an example if possible um and 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 if it was successful uh, why it was successful and and if not maybe what what the problem sure was. i can talk about our uganda in terms of the social aspect so um within uganda new energy nexus has a program called Inventure. we work with community-based organizations we provide financing um sometimes in the form of stock and initially in the form of very small loans so 500 dollars um, we, the stock that we sell are um, solar lanterns, um, clean energy, fuel briquettes, um, uh, environmental water filters. So they're, they're small products and we work in the last mile. So this is really for people that do not have access to energy. Um, one of the positives that we've found with our impact analysis is that um, we, uh, with, this, with this funding and this work with the community-based organizations, we also train 
um, mostly women. So 70% of uh, the beneficiaries that we work with um, are women, creating jobs for women. Um, they're the ones that are doing the cooking at home. Um, obviously, the impacts are mean that they're not going out. Um, um, risking, you know, their 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 physical safety, um, and I think that's something that, um, a, as a collective, we should be thinking about. How can we support more women in clean energy entrepreneurship? And so that's a small example from our Uganda program. But I wrote down some stats earlier: is that um, only 13% um, are women-only founders in terms of clean energy enterprises. Um, women are not gaining the access and support systems that that they need. Um, only about 15% of the applications that we're getting in the energy and environment sector are from women-led startups. So one of our new activities that I mentioned before in India is, is having a Women in Energy Entrepreneurship Program, which is a, a set of programs which will be um, educational programs, accelerator programs, focused on um, women um, energy access enterprises. And I think uh, the more that we can focus on women, the better the social outcomes will be. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Sarah. Well, well noted. Um, uh, Florent, going going back to you, um, we have talked about uh, about finance. Um, you you mentioned it uh, as well, um, and 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 the investment um, already. What have we missed potentially in in this discussion, or, or is there something that we need to? push deeper uh, on um, please uh, share your your opinion on this no I, I think I, I very much agree with uh, what John was saying that for the low tier it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of covered or it will be covered what is needed now is how we move from low tier energy access to higher tier energy access uh and how we define like um business models that would support this move uh higher up in the energy ladder and i think that's that's de definitely something important and what he was saying about uh having specific products having uh guarantee funds uh to develop and to move to a higher tier energy access is something fundamental uh i think um and also the need to have proper data because I'm pretty sure it's it's always difficult to have the, the data on the customers. Um, so trying to develop ways of monitoring the use uh, remotely, so being by sensors, being by uh, other type of, um, of ways. And then one of the one of the things we haven't discussed, but that's where Endev is also uh, going toward this uh, standardization and quality control of the appliances. So working with Clasp and Verasol to make sure that the appliances are, have a, a minimum quality standards that is sometimes uh, lacking. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> not much to, to add. I think uh, John summarized everything really pretty well. <laughs> so I don't, I don't want to, to overstep that. Um, just one thing maybe, um, I think in transport and, and local mobility, I think we have seen more and more a few e-bikes, a few cargo systems that are used or can be used by farmers to collect uh, or to help them during harvest and to transport products. That's something that is starting a bit. And um, yeah, just, no, but the, on the finance part, I think it was pretty well summarized by John. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Florent. And um, I don't see Alexander, but I assume he is there. Um, Alexander, I, you, you're yes. there, yeah, great. Um, I would like to to shift uh, the the perspective uh, again to to some of the points that that you said. I mean, these are 
analytical elements, right? Which methodology would we need to to define what exactly is sustainability? What is the cost to the to the society? Um, would you mind sharing a bit more on that to um, because the 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 the, the application of this of this thinking is relevant worldwide of course um but in advanced economies is maybe more pressing than in um in in sub-saharan africa um or not uh, i don't know but can you can you push a bit more on how we can actually um take start taking that into account or maybe it's already happening in in a country that you know um uh, ideally a, a developing country uh, what would be the the way forward there not just from a, from an academic or analytical perspective but also from a practice practitioner's perspective any any insights Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. That is that that counts in the end. So what I mentioned with the sustainability assessment, which we do, for example, that gives us an understanding of the value chain of the food system and of the state of the art, for example. And then we can also um, um, try at least to uh, model what would be the outcome if we change this value chain. And you know, it's not just replacing one technology with the other or switching from one energy source to the other. Then you change a lot of pre and post steps in the value chain. And here sustainability assessment can give you a good understanding where you go and where you are. So that is the, that is the data um, exercise. And then in our team, at least, and at ETH Zurich, we have a focus clearly on alternative protein rich products because that is a hot topic, meat substitutes, for example, alternative protein sources and um, the whole uh, food waste and waste uh, aspect, which are major impactful elements of our current food system where we want to tackle our um, our approaches. And uh, there we act, for example. And here we selected um, different solutions based on microalgae uh, production ch value chains and insect-based production chains, um, which are quite often use more energy and if it would come from a renewable source, then they can deliver the full sustainable, uh, sustainability potential. But currently we use quite often non-renewable energy for these uh, more energetic sources. And then the direct comparison with the benchmark is not beneficial. And one example, you asked me for a developing country or for um, more developing areas. We collaborate in the insect research and development here with um, our partners in Kenya, in uh, in Tanzania, in South Africa, in China, Indonesia, where we have already facilities growing insect on organic waste. Um, and we want to uh, use these insects then as fish meal replacement, because fish meal um, has a significant biodiversity loss quite often when it's based on small catch from the ocean. Energy use is also involved. So um, we did a life cycle assessment with, um, with a startup company in the Netherlands, Protex, um, and could nicely show what is the impact in switching from the existing energy mix to a completely renewable energy mix. And, you know, based on the company did it. And they even said, we didn't, in, you know, ask for funding money or so on. We just did it because it was so much better for our business. And they could also much more pronounce their sustainability uh, improvement. With our partners in Kenya, for example, where we also collaborate with ICP and also a startup which is called Sanaji, an MIT startup, where they grow um, insects on waste, we have other issues, I think. It's a very different um, uh, scene and ecosystem. And here, for example, we focus currently on safety of the products when it's grown on waste. And um, in general, when we think about waste, um, the highest priority shouldn't be to use the waste, the highest priority should be to avoid the waste generation. So, again, the thinking in this three-dimensional sustainability aspect can help also sometimes. And, you know, for the insects, everybody's focused on using the waste streams, but in general, we should first reduce the waste. And that is always also linked to energy consumption. When you reduce waste generation, you can also directly you, uh, reduce energy consumption. And then, you know, we have to think in this holistic terms and the SDG of the United Nations, by the way, they are all they are all located in this three-dimensional space as well. Thank you, Alexander, and, and also for that uh, example that you mentioned for the for the insect growing. It was Indonesia, Indonesia, I I believe. This 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 re-emphasizes once again that we 
have to be careful also with um, uh, the clean energy um, of, of, of the um, agricultural value chain. Of course, we want to, to uh, have ways to energy applications wherever feasible, but we should not distort um, uh, maybe the maybe the bio waste is already used for something else or could be used for another purpose better maybe in this case uh, where you grow um, insects rather than maybe replace uh, uh, transform that organic waste into into heat or power that is something that we we do have to bear uh, in mind uh, and and requires an, an a holistic uh, uh, approach uh, as you mentioned before and not to have sometimes um, one-dimensional uh, approaches looking at the, at the energy side uh, only. So thank you for that, um, Alexander. And I believe we have uh, some... Mark, can I sure, maybe please. briefly comment? Mark, can I comment only on... I, I strongly suggest that we should focus especially on that, Mark. Thanks so much. When we have a stream or a substrate that we first go for the material utilization, that is also clearly uh, described in the bioeconomy principles before we go to an energetic utilization. And when I say material utilization, I mean, can we use it for biotech, for food, for feed? Um, that was also the problem of the first generation bioeconomy where we grown, for example, crops, which can be directly used as food and then used, um, uh, used it for the energetic utilization. And then we have the, um, the, uh, the the plate tank competition that has strong social uh, issues yes. involved. Um, Thank you so thanks, much, Mark. Alexander. Um, fully agreed. Um, I see a comment in the in the chat uh, of uh, Florent, and I'm going to to read it in a second. But in order not to lose time, um, John, um, you've said a lot of good things already based on on the on this round of additional inputs um any further thoughts on 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 our key enablers on um we've talked about financing we've not talked so much about technology or capacity what have we missed what do you think we may have missed or what needs further attention well uh, that, that's a good question, and I, I did want to kind of mention one point that Alexander was talking about, and I think one of the one of the things that I would like to see more of, at least, you know, being uh, in more kind of finance and, and implementation oriented organization, um, more collaboration with particularly the academic side, and and you know, we are talking a lot about sustainability. One of the things that we're grappling with now is e-waste, just as one example. Um, but I think one of the, you know, we will start to have more and more questions about the actual, uh, the sort of negative impacts of some of these technologies that we're right now promoting. Uh, solar irrigation, for instance. I, I think widespread solar irrigation use um, has a lot of benefits, obviously, for uh, supporting food support, for food security, uh, improving uh, yields. Um, but it will also have an impact on uh, soil salinity and soil quality um, over a period of time. And so these are things that, uh, you know, we have questions a lot, you know, and, and I think before uh, Corona times, you know, we would get more and more, I would have more uh, interaction with uh, people who would ask tough questions about the actual programs we were running. You know, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Um, and that's super important because uh, this is how, you know, how we can build in a lot of the thought and conceptual design that's happening in, in universities, um, in economic think tanks, you know, at the macro level, and build these into actual practical uh, instruments and apply them as best we can to the sector. Um, but one of the things that's, that's missing is still, I think, the actual then uh, farmers and and uh, a lot of the a lot of the um, business models that we see are based on assumptions of, um, you know, uh, internal rate of return that are based on cash flows that are based on revenues that are based on prices that are based on volumes that are based on access. And, and these, this, this access is what's, what's missing um, a lot of times. It's not only access. A lot of times it's, you know, uh, just old, old school practices. I mean, most of the areas that we work 
um, agriculture is just overwhelmingly rain fed, uh, primarily maize and then some other uh, like smaller cash crops, but, but nothing that's really, you know, our sector uh, or our kind of beneficiaries are mostly like rural uh, and, and peri-urban um, parts of very poor countries. And um, these models would be, uh, are, are only viable when uh, these crops can actually be sold and, and sold regularly. I think, you know, a typical customer of a tier one, I mean, thinking in terms of tiers of energy services, a like tier one, tier two energy user uh, is, is growing some food for themselves um, primarily for themselves and then selling whatever they have left over uh, on, you know, a local kind of uh, informal market. And they don't, there's no business case for that, for that uh, smallholder, uh, quasi, like sort of quasi subsistence farmer to make an investment into, into uh, you know, a, a, a transformative technology at this time. And so, you know, agricultural extension services, um, you know, dealing with communities, this is all super, super important still and will and will continue to be and, and capacity building um, hugely important. And uh, I think doesn't doesn't get enough investment. There's a big, you know, donor countries specifically, and, you know, we're dealing a lot with donors um, like to focus on on putting capital into the market. Um, they love this. Uh, but, you know, capacity building and this technical assistance is, is still hugely, hugely important uh, in this sector. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I, I see some, um, some potential answers to our initial questions appearing, like what are key enablers? I mean, also some um, remarks in the margins uh, about sustainability um, and and uh, and and some 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 caution in in some ways. Um, we still have some time. Um, I don't see questions from from the chat box. I I hope there's still an audience. Uh, I think there is. Um, one thing that you mentioned, John, is also interesting, what you said, the, the business models that exist and the assumptions that are behind it. Um, what what with, with now the impact of COVID? Um, uh, I imagine that is an extremely difficult question in order to assess, but but would anyone know of, of cases or countries where there is um an impact maybe maybe even for the for the for the better maybe even as an opportunity that that there is a, a shift towards more locally oriented uh, value chains or not or are we rather going to see uh, primarily negative impacts does anyone have any any thoughts or or examples uh, on that the floor is is open just um if you if you if you have anything to comment on that, please do. Maybe I can I can take it from the energy point of view. I think the impact. Uh, uh, I I haven't seen any much positive impact because these value chains. So if you take energy technologies, they are so globalized that you've seen that um, like. In Tanzania, for instance, they, they are importing all the solar panels from China or from other sources. So even if they, the, the off-grid companies had clients, uh, which was another big problem, then they could not supply them with the, with the technologies. Um, and then for all the off-grid companies, like all the market uh, kind of crashed. Uh, so they have... Uh, reduce their sales by 20%, not being able to retain the clients. Um, yeah, as a program, we, we, we've we set up a, what we call fast track uh, support, uh, mostly targeting off-grid companies, so solar off-grid companies and, um, and clean cooking companies, but it was not going towards the productive use uh, sector because you have 
such a big market or such a big uh, household energy access uh, ecosystem that um, PUD would come afterwards, I guess. But that's very personal, and that's that's what we have seen in the uh, in the five countries we we supported in the last three months on on the COVID specific response, yeah. and then a bit more um, action and a bit of what more awareness on um, indoor pollution. So that's something we we COVID kind of help us to to get more messaging on uh, indoor air pollution. So we had a campaign in Uganda where we pretty much in phases this point uh, and then electrification of health centers. But I, yeah, that's what we have seen in the last uh, five, six months from our side. Yeah, thank you, Florent. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna put the COVID question on hold for a second because there's a question from the audience um, and the, uh, one participant is asking, how can you enable progress and overcome resistance in the use of renewable energy in, de in developing countries like India, Bangladesh and Nepal, where farmers, especially small and medium-sized farmers, still struggle with irrigation and electrification? Anyone wants to reflect on that? Can take it. Um, I think it's... it's is a bit what John was saying is to put the user at the center uh, because like the, the the pump that works are the one that are the cheapest where you don't really need to do a lot of things so you just put your solar panel and then you have your your very small pump that is pumping uh, uh, two meters three meters and that's how it works and I think the organizing demonstrations through cooperatives, through extension services, through uh, green innovation centers, that's what works, uh, especially in irrigation. I mean, you need to see the thing working, otherwise you will never set it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Florent. We are almost out of time. We have um, one more minute, maybe. Um, Can I, Sarah, you yeah, want to say something, I just please? I quickly want to add to that. I think, and it hasn't been touched on yet, um, and it's actually not part of our core business, but the regulatory framework is so important. And, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry is still heavily subsidised and there needs to be a massive transition um, to incentivise clean energy solutions and we need to transition away. We've got 10 years, it's such a short time frame. And I think that's quite important. New Energy Nexus behind the scenes. In California in particular, we, we do run a clean energy business roundtable. It's a very private event where we get together um, government, policymakers, corporates, um, key influencers once a year to have a very open conversation about how how do we scale the, the clean energy transition. And that's in California. If we can be doing that in India, if we can be doing that in Africa, and as much as possible getting strong regulatory frameworks, then I think that will help um, rapidly. Yeah, and I think uh, Leonardo Barreto, hi, Leonardo is basically confirming that uh, as well yeah, in the chat. Um, Emma is entering the session. I believe that means we are going to be forced uh, to close. Um, but I, it's very short. We went into many directions, but I, I, I enjoyed it. Um, thank you all for such a, a great and rich and um, fruitful discussion, uh, food for thought for, for further um, discussion and thinking. Um, all for now and thank you all again both my panelists and the audience thank you and see you in the plenary thank you welcome everybody uh with the, the panel is complete welcome to the da data and evidence session of this virtual series today my name is katrin i'm from the Banky moon center and i will be moderating the session today um, and just a very quick round of introductions. We have uh, Ali from IRENA, who has got a wow. background in off-grid and energy access. Uh, we have Alice from Sustainable Energy for All, who's also been working on ecosystems, uh, climate change adaptation, and most recently also on cooling for sustainable value chains. 
Uh, we have Renee from the Arizona State University, who is more uh, working on energy and engineering and logistics, um, data use on efficiency of logistics as well. Um, David from the FAO, uh, most uh, long background on sustainable value chains. And last but not least, Gabor from UNIDA, who has done, done a lot of research on data-driven investments. Um, we have uh, four big questions that we need to answer today in the next 45 <coughs> minutes. Um, so I suggest let's dive right in. Our first question is, how can investment in sustainable energy, especially for value chains, be increased? And so what are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What is holding it back? And are there any strategies that we can apply to, to make this investment more, more available? Uh, and I'd like to kick this round off right away with Ali, please. What do you think? No, thank you, Kat. I think Ali, it's uh, like a, you know, there's a very, you can say diverse uh, question, but I would probably start with, you know, with the holding back part of the question, because I think the reverse of that is true. Uh, you know, when it comes to opportunities and, you know, what can be done. So specifically, I would say that, you know, um, the, the, there is, uh, you know, how, how agriculture or, you know, the like the the way agriculture is seen is still very, very linear. You know, we, we still look at it from a product base, you know, how, you know, we look at yields, we look at, you know, production numbers, uh, you know, Countries have agriculture as a priority, water as a priority, energy as a priority, but the intersection of this, uh, you know, with climate resilience, I mean, that has to be prioritized. And then when you um, go into that, go deeper into it, uh, you know, specifically on investments, you know, uh, you still have a large prevalence of fossil fuel subsidies, you know, in, in agriculture, particularly in, uh, you know, developing countries. You have a lot of the agricultural businesses still operating outside of the formal economy. So when you do market research, when you look into, you know, you go, uh, you kind of, you, you tend to miss out uh, a lot of the businesses because, you know, simply those numbers aren't really reflected, you know. So when we say, um, you know, how can we increase and, you know, what are some of the opportunities? I mean, technically, there's a potential across the entire value chain, whether you start from the farming practices, you know, from water sourcing, greenhouses, to, you know, processing transportation, you know, across the value chain, you will find areas where uh, improving energy availability and affordability will add value to the, you know, to the end product, uh, you know, will improve market access, will improve, uh, you know, or will reduce losses. So, you know, the opportunities exist across, but, you know, uh, in, in terms of increasing the investment, uh, firstly, I would say, you know, financial products have to be tweaked to sort of capture, uh, you know, this, this, this potential. I mean, uh, and and from a strategic perspective, you know, uh, more effort has to be has to go into to perhaps uh, you know aggregate this demand, and and you know create uh, higher volumes. You know, um, and 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 I would say that you know from I mean there are limitations to collateral based financing, and you know typical agricultural uh, you know lending sticks to. You know how, and you're still focused on the person, on the individual, but you need to go into the more, the value chain, and into the uh, you know the you can say the the cash flows, and um, yeah, and, and then I then I would perhaps conclude that you know from like at, at the uh, level of the government, as I mentioned, that you know the the overall policy approach has to has to capture the, the nexus approach. I mean, there has to be a you know a more um, how shall I say, a more, uh, uh, you know, more, uh, I would say, a, a, a prioritization of the interrelation of all of these, you know, of, of energy, you know, uh, of, of agriculture, of water. I mean, as a simple example, you know, a lot of countries have uh, public public funded agricultural research, but rarely do you see agricultural research going into what what are the energy constraints faced by farming communities. So, you know, if, if this kind of, uh, you know, if, if you look at the holistic picture, you can actually identify and, 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 and public funding or public support where it's being channeled can actually help identify areas uh, and, you know, markets that are otherwise, you know, not really visible. So I think I'll pause here, given that okay. we've got a, la a large panel and a lot of Yes. Questions. Thank you, Ali. Uh, over to you, Alice. What do you think? Hi, thank you, Catherine. Uh, just before I start, I'm just going to apologize briefly because uh, my neighbor is starting to do some renovations. So there's a lot of drilling 
happening. So apologies if there is some uh, uh, loud background noises. But I'm going to echo a little bit of what Ali just said. Uh, I think places with low agricultural incomes and low density of rural populations, which usually tends to not be seen as interesting markets, uh, will likely necessitate grants or highly concessional finance to stimulate market development, uh, possibly by aggregate, uh, by facili uh, possibly uh, facilitated by innovative methods to aggregate demand. I think uh, the problem there, one of the things holding it back is just in, in rural areas, uh, the demand is not really being seen or understood that there is a, a big demand and there is an op opportunity to increase um, uh, uh, investment there. That's why it's important to focus on cost effectiveness or first cost of more sustainable solutions. An example of this is, uh, for instance, uh, result-based financing or overseas development assistance program targeting key elements uh, of the value chain, such as uh, sustainable energy for post-harvest activities like uh, cooling for storage or, or even some parts of um, uh, agricultural processing. Uh, and so with limited uh, funds available in many countries, these type of finance measures are very important and can be key to creating an enabling environment for private investments uh, in most sustainable solutions going to uh, you know, the link between agriculture and, and energy. I'm going to stop there because I can hear the drilling going a little bit louder, but uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Alice. I couldn't hear the drill, so it's a good sign, I think. Uh, let's go to Rene from a more engineering background. What do you see? Well, well uh, thank you. And uh, let me just uh, share a couple of thoughts with you. So one of the, the question was, uh, how can investment in sustainable energy value chains can be, how can that happen? I have three thoughts. So if we are going to get investment in particular in sustainable energy, so there are three ways, according to me, there are the way that the, the, the stakeholder is going to see a benefit. So benefit because it's going to improve the, the profit is going to improve the revenue that they're going to have, that's number one. That, that I would say that, that that would be kind of a push type of system. The other one is a pull type of system. And that's the one that I'm the most interested is how to how to educate the, the the consumer in such a way that the consumer is going to demand to have those opportunities those opportunities happen. So in in that case, um, the the consumer is going to vote with their uh, purchases. So the question is, how are we going to be able to get information to the to the consumer in such a way that is going to have an impact on on the on the on the supply chain? That's the second thing. The third one. And, and purposely I left that at the, at the end, is going to be some kind of a governmental intervention, okay? Is how are you going to get the government to, 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 uh, to, to, to finance this type of opportunity? So for me, the keys are the first two. So how to identify potential opportunities for the stakeholder, in particular the grower, and how is that going to, uh, uh, how is that going, to, how are we going to make that connection between the supply and demand? Okay, so that we are going to have opportunity uh, opportunity there. So, and I, I'm going to come back to this issue that I think that the, the previous two speakers they talk about, with, which is the idea of aggregation. Uh, so, for instance, my experience with the, uh, the industrial assessment center is that it doesn't matter that you find opportunities for improvement if the finance uh, the, the finance is not there, that's not going to happen. So, the question: of How are you going to do that? And the only way that to do that is through what. What, through aggregators, we call that supply chain, supply chain articulators. So it's essentially what is going to be somebody that is going to look at the, the whole opportunity and is going to aggregate both demand and supply. And based on that, it's going to make a, a, a financial case for, for an external investor to get interested in applying that and in return with a, a, for, for, a, for, for a return investment. So, but that's kind of in general what the, the, the idea that I would like to uh, to leave here. I'm going to retake that in the second in the second intervention about how we are going to be able to make the consumer actually pull. Okay, great. Thank this, you so much, uh, uh, um, David. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, okay, good. Um, just want to clarify maybe at the beginning that um, I'm not uh, an energy expert, let alone a renewable energy expert, but energy, the use of energy is, is part of our, as, as, as one of the many components that we want to, that we need to look at when we do sustainable value chain development. And so it's all about the balancing of, of these things. And so from my perspective, if, if you look at the question of how can we promote investment, well, one, one of the things is that there has to be much, much sort of uh, more broader awareness raising and sort of more systematic integration of looking at renewable energy options whenever you do value chain development programs, right? which is the main focus of, of, of me and, and my job and, and the organization that I work for. Um, and so to, to make sure that, that we, we, look, we look at those options more in a, in a systematic way, right? that often is not looked at, that, it, that is looked at in, in the first place. When you when you think about promoting investments, other than as a first step being aware about it, is is to look at where the investment needs to take place as one question, and then how to finance that investment from the from the other side. So th those two things need to be in place at the at the same time. Um, and when we think about where needs to be where, where the investment needs to take place, um, th this 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 um, is not just within the value chain it, itself. Maybe the investments need to also take place on the supplier side of the technology, or the support provision, or the maintenance, um, and other aspects of of, of the technical um, technical advice that needs to be delivered. Um, and and if you look at it from the from the financing side. Um, it, it's all about sort of um, de-risking the, the the investment, right? And so we rightly talk about scale, and in some some instances, some things only make sense at a certain scale. But w when you when you talk about um, de-risking it for financial um, uh, for finance providers, which are maybe national banks, maybe international financial institutions, maybe investment funds, um, you you need to de-risk it by first proving that that the uh, technology has has a business case be behind it that it makes sense that it's not just um, it, it's not just making sense from a from a technical and a business perspective but also in the the specific communities where you expect this to be to be adopted um, and that 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 measures are put in place support mechanisms to make sure that all these act all these different factors are, are taken into account all these risks that are potentially there there's some solution in place to to deal with that and show first that, a, that on a pilot case it can work and then scale it up from from there but working with the banks directly making sure that the, the banks are sort of providing the financing for investments in in renewable energy um, options but maybe start off with a loan guarantee scheme to to get that going and make sure that there are complementary um, complementary um, investments taking place alongside the, the direct investment in the, in the technology. And maybe as a, as a last point, also to when you look at financing, th there's a lot of funding out there in, in, in the world. Um, and some of it is really targeting the sort of more environmental aspects and would be more in, keen and more interested in making these sort of investments and especially maybe also at, at an early stages and then or, or at the scale up stage um, of, of uh, applying such, uh, such technologies. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Gabo, so we're talking about investments. How can we get them? May I come? Good, good afternoon. Good day, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see Catherine, so I, I'm going to continue. And perhaps um, I also want to mention that I'm not an energy economist. I would join David and also a couple of points which he uh, mentioned I would reiterate. Number one is the industry awareness, which is definitely important uh, in terms of create of having a, a demand-driven di approach. So it's not something what we are trying to uh, sort of we are trying to encourage the, the industry to to apply. Rather, they are already has certain level of awareness on the availability of certain technologies. At the same time, we also have to, and probably as a second point, and uh, as David mentioned, the economic uh, viability of any sort of project, because the industry is going to think with, uh, uh, from the, the monetary aspect, they are going to look at the numbers at the end of the day, and uh, we have to know and see, are there any sort of incentives, policy incentives available for the, the industry to actually um, apply those uh, those solutions and invest also from their side in uh, new uh, uh, renewable energy solutions, for instance. And finally, the the supportive business environment, which is very important and is linked to the incentives. That are there services available? It's it's one thing that uh, we, for instance, uh, try to pilot a new technology in a, in a country. 
but um, uh, to, to see the, the sustainability aspect of any sort of investment. Do we have all the, the, the means in order to actually upscale any sort of uh, good pilot in the future? And uh, I would stop here because I think uh, we have still a lot of things to, to discuss. Thank you. Thank you, Gabo. Exactly, we have. And so we go right into the next one and looking at more of the data perspective, actually. And we're wondering how can we, uh, what data do we need to assess the potential for sustainable energy in value chain upgrading in a specific country? So, what is really missing to make the right decisions in terms of data? And Perhaps, I think. Uh, I'm the only one, or all of you cannot hear Catherine at this stage? I, I can hear Catherine. Yeah, I can, I can hear her. Here and see Catherine. Yes. There must be something okay. with Unido's <laughs> internet. <laughs> uh, it's, um, let me write it. I'll, I'll text so, uh, uh, Gabor. May I suggest just to, to move on to the, the second question? We, we, uh, are, uh, we are moving we, to the second question. <laughs> can somebody please tell Gabor to, to wait for me to text him, please? Uh, Rene, if I could give you the floor. <laughs> <laughs> the data question. Thank you. Uh, so so let, 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 let me go back to my point about uh, data and uh, how to get the consumer more engaged into this. And when uh, when I saw this question, I was going to start talking about or the, uh, the, my first reaction was to start talking about the profile of, uh, of the, uh, the electricity generation and all that. But thinking a little bit, a little bit more. So I started thinking about what is the main thing that you, you need to actually make something that is going to be sustainable. So we need to look at the value chain. So that's that's critical. Okay. So that the value chain to, to determine if actually the, the intervention that we're going to be making is actually going to pay off. Right? Pay off. Okay. Otherwise, we're going to be wasting everybody's money and time. Okay. But the question is, uh, once again, if I retake the the the, uh, uh, the issue about the consumer, what information or what can we combine this issue about uh, uh, the information and value chain? and also energy footprint of what we produce or what we consume. So and right now, we don't have the systems in place that are going to So if you, look, uh, if you look at the data in terms of energy, you are going to have very broad, uh, very broad uh, uh, data, uh, data sets, but we are not going to know exactly the type of product that we consume, how the, how the, what is the energy footprint of that. So something that, that, that we need to do is to establish an energy traceability system based on each one of the products and to provide that information that to a consumer so that the consumer is going to make decisions. So, uh, so the question is, we need to track with how, how is that going to look that traceability system? Well, something that we can do, we can track every one of the products by, by having a, a smart uh, logistic system that is going to allow us to do that. So something that we're working on is what we call mini containers. That essentially that's what it's going to do. It's going to trace by each one of the steps of the supply chain and provide that information to the uh, to the consumer. I'm going to stop here because I've run out of time. Thank you, Rene. This is fascinating. It's interesting to see how this would work um, on a European setting because we just had a similar discussion uh, on a European level. Gabor. Now that you see and hear me. <laughs> yeah. And you are the only one I couldn't see and hear it's interesting. And I'm about this. Uh, so what, what data do we need to make the right decisions? Well, uh, I think my, my colleagues who are uh, more knowledgeable about the energy sector are going to address very well the, this point. But at the same time, we also have to, to think about how we want to actually achieve this whole data connectivity. Uh, because um, it's, it's not going to happen in a manner where uh, different actors are actually collecting data without any sort of interaction. And um, setting up this collaborative work from the beginning, uh, it's, it's very important. So there are duplication, there might be um, avoidance of duplications or we using certain data sources for verification. So these type of, um, of measures from the beginning have to be uh, ensured. But certain data points might not give us also the full picture. It's also important to know. And it also, we have to look at uh, certain data points in relationship with, uh, with others. If you want to go to, for instance, the agri-food value chains into more agri-food value chains, 
if you are looking at only production data, uh, we cannot really assess uh, the, the, the level of, of what is on the, the, the market. But we have to also look at, for instance, the post-harvest loss, uh, as well as uh, issues related to, to compliance. Uh, and then we can see what type of products uh, are available at, at, on a safe level to, to consumers. Um, I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, over to you also from a sustainability perspective. Uh, yes. Um, so m maybe what what I would like to add to 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 this discussion is um, m maybe a number of of places where data could be collected. I, I think it echoes some of the the, the comments that Gabor was making as as well. Um, I mean, we need to look at um, at at energy use and the, and the potential for the introduction of renewable energy uh, options in terms of the performance assessment, obviously, because otherwise we cannot measure whether what we're doing would, would have an impact. We need it at the level of, of trying to understand um, the current energy use um, and, and the potential adoptability of, of other uh, mechanisms based on a whole range of, of factors. And we need to look at the actual impact that an upgraded um, um, uh, uh, upgraded, let's say, more renewable um, energy source would have. So, so this data needs at, at three levels in that sense. The other sort of dichotomy that that I'd like to to apply to this is to look at both the the width of the data that are 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 needed, uh, sort of the, the scope, and the level of of depth, the level of detail in the data that that are needed. Um, in, in terms of of the the depth, like, I mean, how far do we want to go in making sure that the data are are rel reliable, um, that, that we really understand um, the, why c certain performance is, is there, why, why there's a certain energy use. Because if we want to introduce some, some new um, source of energy, a more renewable one, we have to understand first what, you know, what, why they're using what they're using at, at, at the moment. Um, and and like how detailed, how refined do we want these, these measurements to be? Are there more sort of broad level indicators at the value chain level or at each node, say the production node or the processing node of the value chain, or, or is it much more, uh, much more refined and, and we measure it at, at a really a, a number of, of, of aspects? And in terms of the width, it's, it's sort of the, that, it, that it covers, yeah, like not just one node in the value chain, but, but throughout the value chain, um, that, it, that it looks at the, the cost, that it looks at the the technical performance, that it looks at the supply of the technology, that looks at technical assistance that, that is there, that it looks at the behavioral dimensions that, that, that come into play. Because in the end, any upgrading strategy is always about um, behavioral change, right? It's about people adopting something new. And so we have to understand the incentives and capacities that, that people face. And often it's, that's not done. We just look at data that link to, or data that looks at the capacity. We know they like this, and, and so we need to build the capacity to do it. They like access to finance, like they're not aware of the new technology, but typically it's a combination of all of those that we need to take into account and, and address in our upgrading strategy simultaneously. And so you need data on, uh, probably on a relatively wide range of, of um, aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alice, what is your opinion? Thank you. I'm also going to just uh, add to what has been said earlier. <coughs> I think it's uh, important that we look at the potential and opportunity of markets, uh, of the market to provide adequate supply for the upcoming demand, and importantly, a sustainable supply that will take into account a sustainable solution to support a resilience uh, to climate change impacts such as increased heat waves, uh, rainfall, and, and droughts. And I'm saying that because, uh, Gabo, you mentioned quite a bit earlier about uh, demand growth. I think predicting demand growth is going to be very important. I think it's still, at least from what I've seen, it's still a little bit lacking, especially when connecting uh, energy and, and, and food systems. And this is, I think, because when it comes at least to certain uh, subnational and disaggregated, disaggregated data, um, I think in the agriculture sector is really quite well. I think we can find, uh, you know, disaggregated uh, data when it comes to women in agriculture, youth, male, and this unfortunately is still a little bit lacking in the in the energy sector. So I think on the energy sector we have a lot to uh, work to do to get and to start working on really disaggregating disaggregating data, finding what's how women are getting, you know, uh, uh, being impacted by a lack of access to to sustainable energy, how income uh, is, is being impacted uh, uh, by energy. And all of this, I think, once the energy sector has some of this information, it's going to be easier to, to link up with the agriculture sector 
and being able to understand fully uh, uh, the, the, um, the status of, 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 of different challenges and also to start making proper uh, uh, prediction demand growth because I think this is going to be key when talking about uh, uh, value chain operating. Um, just maybe a quick example that you know we did a, a quick work on on looking into this uh, subnational data in India uh, in order to understand the needs and to assess the needs of cooling. What you know how how especially thinking in, in 2050 when you know the the temperatures are soaring and, and we know that there is a lot of uh, 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 the middle income is really growing in India. So how is this going to look? At, you know when it's really warm and you need the refrigeration to store your food how how what are the needs and, and how you can assess this type of of demand and how you can start already thinking about this value chain upgrading in in you know this type of countries so we need this uh disaggregate disaggregated data especially in the energy sector to be able to understand um exactly what is going to be needed in the future thank you thank you very insightful and ali we can't hear you ali me now Yes, yeah, thank sorry, you. I, I muted myself. Uh, right, so uh, no, thank you. Uh, I think I, in general, I you know would agree with the, all that has been said by the uh, you know panel before me. Uh, but I would just say that just to add to what's been said, I would say that you know when when analyzing the overall value chain and you know trying to identify different nodal points where uh, energy interventions can be made, I think there are two aspects that you know really um, and like you know in, in addition to looking into the the energy baselines and all that. I mean, for from the end user's perspective, is a, is quite critical as well. You know, if you're going to propose an energy intervention or an energy solution, you know, what is the ability and willingness to pay of the end user that would suppose, you know, for for whom that uh, product and 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 then to the extent possible, the products and the solution design has to reflect, uh, you know, the uh, ability and the willingness to pay of the end user. So the overall, so you know, you may have a technology that would work, uh, you know, they, that could solve certain problems, but you know, unless uh, it, you know the affordability issue is uh, looked into very carefully, it's not really going to take off. And then, then similarly, uh, you know, at, at technical level, um, you know, the, you know, I mean, uh, in addition to all that has been said, I mean, you know, the the services aspect of it, you know, if you're targeting remote mountain communities, for instance, and you know let's say you know presently there's a there's very high uh, wood consumption you could have a you know renewable energy based solution but, you know once you supply that how do you ensure that you know there is uh, you know uh, some sort of uh, operation and maintenance support that is offered uh, beyond the initial product supply so i would say that, you know for these specific parts and 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 particularly you know from the analysis i, I would say rather than the data perspective the analysis perspective has to look into how these, uh, you know, aspects can be integrated, and um, yeah, and 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 then I completely agree uh, with what was said earlier that you know there is the present needs, there's the present energy practices and the present needs that are there, and you know you have to factor in you know what would be the value add once uh, you know another another form of energy comes in. So like you know what is the present energy consumption and what could be future? I mean you know what could be an, an increase in energy consumption. Uh, once uh, a viable solution has been provided, so you know that that angle has to be covered in the analysis, and that data, to the extent possible, has to be estimated. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think in uh, looking at the time, let's try and um, combine the last two questions because we're looking in the last two question about. Um, what are the specific data gaps? So where are we really, where do we really see a problem where they don't know there's a black hole about data um, to help de-risking the finance, which was which actually came up earlier already in the conversation. Um, and then also looking at, in, you know, the, the counterpoint to that, what is available? And uh, what is available but not for free? And how can we make it free? How can we make people share data with us? Um, and since I'm combining this, I'll go with Alice first, because you haven't gone for it. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so first I would say what's available. Um, I would uh, maybe I'll start with what is not available at this moment, especially for the energy sector. Um, 
I think we have uh, still uh, lacking a broad overview of investments flows towards end user services in agriculture sector. So end user services, I'm thinking of water pumps, irrigation, pro uh, irrigation and, and, and processing or storage for, for cold chain. Um, today in the energy sector, unfortunately, most of the investment is still targeting household products and not business or livelihoods. And I think what would be uh, very helpful, I think this data is there, it's just that it's usually on, on the private side and they usually tend not to share those type of data, which is very understandable. But we would need really to get um, either from the private sector, or at least for some of the major donors uh, to uh, have some sort of coordination amongst them and making sure that uh, uh, whatever grants or, 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 or you know, uh, going towards that is being captured somehow. Uh, this will probably require some entity to take over that um, that service, but I think that would be very helpful. Um, if not to get that data from from private sector, at least having someone uh, trying to capture uh, the uh, um, the grants or or the the funds coming from from. Uh, major donors such as the World Bank or or even um, uh, IFAD. So I think um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else. Uh, but I think mostly that would yeah combine the two answers. So the data is there, but unfortunately, it's not always easy to 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 get a hold of it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, Renee. A <laughs> uh, couple of thoughts. Um, so the uh, this is uh, how to reduce the uh, uh, or how to make finance more uh, available. Is we go back to the to this idea that uh, that if you look at the, at the value chains, uh, usually there is enough and to attract uh, especially uh, external investors. The problem is that data is not in a, in a single place. The data, so you need different uh, uh, different uh, points of data that, that, that are not there. So th that's one of the problems. So the question is, how are you, uh, how are we going to be able to do that? One idea that one idea that we're pursuing, and we're just in the very early stages, is to make uh, uh, is to identify market opportunities through market intelligence, through data science, and things like that, and to make those opportunities available to the um, uh, to to the grower, but that's not that easy. So you need this uh, you need this aggregator, you need this uh, supply what we call supply chain articulators. The question is how do you present this um, this opportunity for for the investors in such a way that they are going to to be attracted. So that's a key. So uh, how are you going to be able to evaluate the whole supply chain? To determine what benefits are you are going to be getting that value chain by by having intervention, energy efficiency, especially uh, uh, cold chain. Suppose that uh, so it depends on where uh, 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 in the different in different areas, different uh, where you look at. But uh, about for instance, uh, is uh, if we can make uh, in this value chain, especially high value uh, high value added products, uh, just a ten percent improvement in uh, full waste. That's going to be a huge opportunity for an investor. The problem is, how are you going to put them together? Okay, so that's the kind of things that we're exploring. So we are developing something that we call Terra Fresh, T E R R A dash Fresh, and essentially that's what we're trying to do. Okay, we don't have we don't have the 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 the, the, uh, uh, the solution yet, but one of the things that we know is uh, we are trying to develop this ecosystem. If somebody wants to uh, to be part of that, they have to provide data. So, so that we're going to have a, a, a data a, a data collection system and we're going to have data repository so that we are going to provide transparency to this to this idea. Once you have transparency, you are going to be able to evaluate a lot better. Thank you. Oh, sorry, were you finished? I didn't. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ali, over to you. No, I'm I see thank it's you. gotten dark <laughs> where you are. And we, I think you're muted again. Bad habit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's evening time here in Abu Dhabi now. So. Yeah, so uh, no, um, I think that in terms of the, uh, you know, data going back into, you know, what's, uh, you know, what are the main gaps? And I, I feel that there's a lot of data available at country level, 
uh, you know, which will be looking into, you know, the yields, the number of persons employed, the acreage, you know, the major, you can say, macro uh, economic uh, information, you would, you would probably find it, you would pr probably find it, you know, it would be available, it would be public. But really, when you, when you go to the intervention level, uh, you know, when you go to what actually can be done, what's like a, what could be a potential, um, you know, so, you know, the, the, the actual investment opportunity is when, you know, data starts getting less and less. You have like more data on the potential, but, you know, converting that potential into real, uh, you know, market based or, you know, proper investment opportunities. Uh, that's that's basically where, you know, a lot of things start going missing, uh, you know, when when you may have, you know, hypothetically speaking, the total number of, uh, you know, the total revenue collect generated in a country, uh, you know, for by a certain agricultural product. But, you know, when you focus on a specific part of that country where there's an energy need, you know, what are the revenues there? So, uh, I, I, unfortunately, there's really no silver bullet, in my opinion, and you, you kind of have to, you know, zoom in and, and home into these specific uh, areas and, and, you know, you basically have to carry out, you know, more detailed analyses of the value chains, identify, you know, what are viable solutions, where they fit in the value chain, and then, you know, create a, a, a way of disseminating that information to financiers, to energy services company uh, companies. And also, uh, you know, because we were talking a lot about demand aggregation, you know, use this information to carry out more community mobilization, you know, creating farming uh, developing like you know individual small farm holdings into cooperatives so the the so you know the investment risks are better covered and you know the volumes improve so i mean i guess it's um yeah and and that's that's you know in a way something that you know you, you kind of have to do it based on the region based on the important uh value chains that exist there based on the areas where there are losses there are you know uh inefficiencies so you, you basically have to adapt this uh, according to uh, the the region and the, the value chain in question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gabor. Um, I would first start with the part, I would start with the question that why are there data gaps? And this is also another issue because a large part of agricultural value chains are part of the informal market as Ali mentioned also before. And when we are talking about informal markets, um, I perhaps would bring you even a, an example. Um, in Pakistan, we have currently an apple value chain project in uh, the north, in the southwestern part called Balochistan, which is approximately the size of Germany with 10 million uh, population. The apple value chain is the, the most strategic one. And when we started to look into this value chain, we realized that there are a lot of gaps. So we needed more data on this matter. We had to identify the different value chain actors. So the, in within a value chain, you have so many different uh, actors coming in and design survey for each of them, including the energy need. Because when we try to improve the food safety compliance or productivity or value addition, this cannot be without two things, energy and electricity and the water. So energy and water are required for the agriculture value chains in order to uh, sustainably operate. So we conducted about 2000 uh, uh, surveys uh, with, with 2000 actors, uh, surveys with 2000 actors. And we realized that at the end of the day, these type of data perhaps are available, uh, but they are also not collected on a periodical manner. So there might be some official statistics from uh, the Agricultural Bureau, but they are conducted in 2011. Since then, you had the three floods and, uh, and uh, different type of uh, climate disasters. So the data would have to be updated. And very quickly, uh, unfortunately, there is less discussion on the data science part, uh, which, which is my strength. Uh, the issue is that even though data is available, for those data is available, it's unstructured data. So it's very difficult actually to clean it. It takes a lot of time. And after that, analyze it. 
And at the same time, what we also shouldn't forget when we are talking about data, that they might be available in PDF format, which is for data scientists is a nightmare, or it's somewhere uh, on the internet. So it's not uh, the, the different uh, companies or actors didn't develop APIs, application programming interfaces. We cannot download this data. We cannot actually analyze it properly. So these are, I think, still big issues which we have to overcome in order to really make sense uh, and, and claim it that we have an evidence on, on agricultural value chains. Thank you. Thank you. And David, last. <laughs> well, still trying to come up with something to add, but actually I want to build on, on what um, Ali was mentioning specifically because it's, it's a situation, my daily situation in a way, because our um, work is on, on, on specific value chains, right? It's on that commodity in that country and data are usually not available at, at, at that level or they are outdated, like I was saying and, and so on. So it's a lot of primary data collection. Um, to, to link that to the, the de-risking part of the, of the question, I, I think we do have probably um, quite a bit of information on the technologies themselves and on their environmental impacts, although I think that sort of data, those performance indicators should be maybe made more, of it, more easily accessible to, to non-energy uh, experts so that you know, value chain practitioners can build it into their work. Uh, we know probably a little bit less on the economics of it, the business case of it, and, and even much less on the behavioral dimensions to introduce these technologies in communities that that um, are, are have all kinds of challenges that, that would come into play. So there's risk of social exclusion, there's risk of not having an impact because we're not looking at this holistically enough, we're just sort of introducing the technology but not the supporting activities, or there may just be negative impacts, right? If, for example, if solar energy is being used and basically the energy is free as long as the sun uh, shines and so if you if you use it for pumping water you may be um, you may be over pumping no and may may have negative impacts in that sense if you use biogas uh, then then it, it 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 uses water and so in arid areas that may not be uh, a good a good renewable energy option when you look at bio um, at biogas from 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 another perspective it also develop it also delivers biofertilizers so there may be a win win um, coming out of this as well. And so at FVO, what we developed is a, a tool called or methodology called Investa, that for a particular value chain, knowing that in most cases we'll have to do primary data collection, looks at the, the energy upgrading from, from a triple bottom line sustainability. So from the economic, social, environmental, once you have a concrete um, pr proposal on, on the table. And this methodology has been, been tested out in, in milk, the milk value chain, vegetable value chains in, in several, several countries. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at Otalia, who is helping us. Do we have enough time for a quick lightning round, or shall we conclude? Oh, she's <laughs> summarized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we shall conclude. We shall All conclude. right. Thank you so much. I, I took notes like crazy. Uh, this is very insightful, and I think we, we have a lot of agreement, actually, amongst us what is needed and where we need to work on a little bit more. Um, I guess I'll invite everybody to come back to the plenary now and uh, hope that I can do our conversation justice when I try to summarize this in a second. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, no, she's saying we have 10 or time until 10 past. So we do have time for a lightning round. Stay here. Oh. <laughs> I go, okay. That was a close call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, let's do it then. Uh, who wants to go first? I have David as my first person to talk in the lightning round, if you're if um, to. Yes, the two things I wanted to highlight, or just two words, balancing and, and standardizing. Balancing the, the costs of, of collecting the, the data versus the, the value of the data. Where, where, how far do you take it is, is one aspect. And standardization, I, I think a lot of the things we're doing um, can be much more standardized in terms of secondary data that is available and in terms of methodologies for assessing the situation. And, and I think you know, that's another way to, to help us uh, get uh, more efficient in, in looking at renewable energy uh, from the data perspective. Wonderful. Thank you. This is a great. Ali, can you top that? <laughs> I, I don't think I can, but I, I would say that, you know, um, perhaps like, you know, as a final word, I would say that, you know, what's uh, critical is looking, you know, at the present and also with an eye on the future. So, you know, present practices, present constraints, 
uh, you know, present expenses, et cetera. And, you know, what would, and, you know, what could be, uh, you know, the, the actual value additions? I mean, what could be, you know, the, so, you know, when you, when you identify, you know, uh, the, the, the possibilities, you know, you start creating space for energy interventions. So, you know, it's, it's important not to be completely bogged down with what has been going on or what is the, pres the present, you know, way things are done. And, and also to sort of, uh, you know, envision something, you know, how those value chains could be modernized as a whole. And, you know, and that opens up and, and that's, that's something that we're presently trying to do and struggling with in, in a project in, uh, with, uh, with EC mode in, in, in the mountain communities of the Himalayan region. And it, it really is a challenge. I mean, you know, so I would say that, you know, just, you know, having a, a, an eye on the future. Um, Excellent. Great. Thank you. Uh, Renee. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that uh, if we talk about energy, uh, how to use sustainable energy, we need to think also about energy storage. So that's very, very important. That's uh, thought number one. Uh, thought number two is this issue of energy footprint and energy uh, energy budget for different crops. Uh, so we need to develop that so that we can understand a lot better uh, interventions, uh, uh, the, the risk and things like that. So those, those are the, the two things that I wanted to, to mention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gabor. Um, I would also mention only two things, perhaps uh, reiterating the importance of data connectivity uh, among different actors and data sharing um, in a in a manner which actually leads to my second point, uh, which uh, ensures the, the moral aspect of data. There are a lot of negative uh, case stories around uh, data at the moment, and it's also important to, to ensure who is the owner of this data, when can uh, it be used, and for, for what purpose, uh, in order to actually also protect uh, individuals and uh, around the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up, actually. This was in my head. Last words go to Ellis. Last words. Um, so just quickly, uh, first, just a, a thanks to the Energy Forum team for organizing this, because I think it's an important conversation to be had. And then lastly, I think uh, my take is that more disaggregated data is really crucial to enable not only the achievement of SDG 7, uh, so sustainable energy, but also the next sectors such as food systems, because this, this data, this type of data would really allow uh, for more inclusive policy measures but also to enable stronger markets. So that's what I'm going to say, my last words here. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you. I'm happy we stopped on a, on a positive note. I think we have to definitely go back to the plenary now. Thank you very much and see you in a second. For Mark, but perhaps we can get started. Um, and thank you all. I mean, I'm, I was jumping around the different rooms and I think uh, it was really an interesting discussion. Interesting in a sense that I saw also, I think particularly in the country voices, we had representatives from Ministry of Industry, uh, uh, people working on food, uh, people working on uh, energy systems. And I heard a lot about the need for integration. So I honestly, that is like uh, an amazing uh, direction as well that we're all coming to here. Uh, but yes, as the moderators, I would be very uh, curious to hear what are your main takeaways um, from the discussion. So perhaps we start with you, Will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, w I wish I had more time to sort of process everything. I took notes furiously. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not 100% confident that I'll capture everything. And there were some great insights, but uh, just to recap for for you all, our our quest, my quest, the questions I was supposed to answer, I think, are they the same for all of us, Rana? No, they're slightly different, uh, but okay. don't like we don't need to go into details. As I mentioned, uh, there will be a report produced for each session, which will okay. present everything. So really, it's your main three takeaways maximum from the discussion, just to be respecting uh, the time. So or the in interesting insights or a common challenge you saw or a nice solution yeah. you want to share with everyone. So as the moderator, you're free to choose whichever of these you like. 
Okay, I, I think one of one of the insights is don't look at it uh, at at the country level. Look at it uh, through typologies. Uh, for example, a specific crop like millet. Uh, it's very difficult to try and generalize across countries. Um, you know, with even within one, the same country, you've got multiple challenges that you're facing that are different from others, and so to try and break it into a country level is is probably not that workable. Uh, so looking at typologies uh, was one thing that I, th I thought was a very interesting uh, uh, insight, uh, as well as you know within those typologies segmenting the opportunities because there are different opportunities within those different typologies. Um, and so, so I, I think look. So I, I heard a lot of look at at this more holistically, but then I also heard look at this more specifically, right? Um, so in it, holistically in the sense that you need to integrate different sense systems together, especially if, you know, beginning from the design phase all the way through to implementation. But then when you're designing something, don't think about it from a country perspective or even a state perspective, but think about it from a, a, a specific crop uh, or application that, that, that you want to uh, be thinking about. Um, so integration from the beginning, design thinking from the beginning. Um, uh, I heard loud and clear that the, the private sector needs to play a critical role, uh, but has to play a critical role without too many market distortions. Uh, there were questions around that, however, around the role for large companies versus small companies, as well as agricultural focused companies versus energy focused companies. And whether, and this goes back to a bigger issue, which is around should we be taking a demand-driven approach to solving these problems or a supply-side approach? In other words, do we base our uh, interventions on the needs of the farmer or do we base our interventions based on the supply of electricity? And I think, you know, at least from my perspective, we, we have to take a much stronger demand-side approach to solving these issues. Um, I think that, uh, the other thing I heard loud and clear um, was around, you know, sort of what, how international organizations need to work better together. Um, you know, uh, in particular, um, you know, around knowledge exchange, sharing best practices so that we're not duplicating effort. There has to be better donor coordination at the country level with governments. Uh, that's still a huge, it seems basic, but it's still a huge gap. Um, and that, uh, yeah, I think, uh, okay. I mean, there, there are many other things, that's, but I'll stop That's there. great food for thought. Yeah. I think yeah. Uh, maybe we can get around as well at the end where you guys can comment on, uh, what you've heard from each other, but now perhaps I'd like to move on to Monica to hear what, uh, the main takeaways in the country voices was. Uh, thank you, Rana. Uh, funny enough, some of the things William mentioned were also stressed at our you know, breakout session, especially regarding integration and co coordination. So for our own group, we looked at a value, a value chain of grading from the product side, from the process side, from system, sectorial and uh, structural upgrading, which was very, very good. I think um, in the report, it would be nice to really break down what this all means. I thought it was very informative from um, Jean-Francois. And we talked about really, you know, the challenges to, to adopting, adopting such technologies at the large scale, mostly relating to the fact that we have very small holder, fam uh, small holder farmers in Africa. And many a times these, uh, these businesses are not formal and nobody knows you know where they are what they are doing when they do sell their products they sell it at the well less than the true value of that product so it's quite difficult to present this to an investor because these businesses are dispersed and they are not well organized so we really hammered on the need to improve coordination first of all to have the small holders uh, to be more like in a formal business setting to ensure that these people can present themselves to investors and to grow. So we talked about integration in also planning. We had from Utopia the case whereby they had invested so much in this very massive and impressive um, agro-processing uh, industrial park 
However, it wasn't being operationalized because there was sort of a connection between the different parties, different ministries, you know, the power ministry and the perhaps the finance ministry. So we talked about the need to have ministries discussing and sharing information, planning together to ensure that whatever long-term goals we have are actually integrated and different ministries are chipping in and using this strategy to uh, decide how they want to move forward in the long term. But we also talked about the need to have local communities working together and being the drivers of change, of this system change, to have them you know, planning and, and just working on how they want to, to move forward, but still having the government level or regional level government to facilitate this uh, you know, development plan. So we looked at the bottom uh, the um, intervention being driven at the, the, the bottom level, but also being coordinated at the top level by the government and other key actors. And of course, our session looked at gender equity, and we all agree that indeed uh, sustainable energy does improve the value chain for agriculture, and women who are very active in the value chain will also benefit. So we looked at them. Um, the case from what the EU is doing, you know, the different projects they've had, the transformational impact these projects have on women. We also looked at the case for Uganda, whereby we see that sometimes uh, cultural barriers could limit the access of, you know, improved technologies for men and women. Uh, so you have cases whereby women may not have access to those technologies due to cultural barriers. So we talked about being mindful of some of these challenges when we design projects and programs and to consider them. So well, uh, that's what we have from our side. Excellent. I mean, having listened a bit to the discussion, I would have liked as well to see where does the role of the private sector. So it's it was uh, uh, clear, for example, in the topic of the agro-industrial parks and also the rural transformation centers. Is there a role there as well for private sector? And what is the business model that um, we would could adopt to actually help with the operationalization of this? Uh, massive infrastructure uh, which is there and uh, supports a great cause of integration uh, and I, I think that's an area that we would really like to perhaps to discuss a bit more um, and now Veronica, I move oops. sorry Veronica I just uh, add two thoughts there one one that you know I think uh, public finance for in that that type of infrastructure was raised as a, a topic within my group as well uh, so the, the the processing centers and things like that they, they thought public finance for infrastructure was needed. And then, you know, philanthropic capital was needed to prove out business models for the private sector. So just a couple other notes there. Super, thanks for sharing that. And I'll move over to Mark to share with us now what happened in the Enablers for Progress. Thank you, Rana. Um, I'll try to capture uh, the rich discussion that we that we had and, and some some words or keywords seem to come back. Um, I heard William say holistic and private sector. Well, these come back in, in my conclusions as well. Um, it, the first one is it's important that we keep in mind that we approach sustainability holistically. Uh, that was brought up that we make sure that um, the three dimensions of sustainable development are going to be sufficiently covered by the interventions that we as an international community uh, apply and use. Uh, for instance, just quickly, um, bio waste, organic waste streams, we have to be careful not blindly converting that uh, into power or heat when maybe there are better uses uh, of that, um, of these waste streams. Uh, that is uh, one, one example. Uh, another one is the social dimension um, in general for uh, job creation and, and, and the local economy, but particularly also for, for women. There is uh, insufficient empowerment still in terms of um, women entrepreneurs, um, uh, even though these could be really driving a transformation of uh, agricultural value chains. That's the first one. Uh, second one, private sector uh, involvement, uh, market-based approaches is something that 
uh, came came in uh, a lot that is um, that is important but at the same time also um, locally can capacities uh, related to financing uh, not be strengthened uh, the example was given that in sub-saharan africa there is uh, apart from some uh, exceptions there is hardly uh, local financing options uh, available is that something that can be that should be looked at uh, and then finally uh, basically making the circle to the to the first one again on social on the social dimension of sustainability is let's uh, keep the user uh, the farmer the the the, the female um, um, uh, the women in 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 the in the whole chain keep them at the center let's 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 not forget that um, uh, the example was given how a, a small farmer in in bangladesh might uh, not want to 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 shift to to renewables for uh, whatever perceptions or reasons so let's uh, keep the user uh, at the center of our deliberations thank you I, I, I love that center, but let's work on convincing them that renewables is the solution. Uh, great. Uh, Catherine, so over to you. And I'm hoping, I'm looking at you to give me some recommendations as well. So. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. I know you can do it, so that's fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we did have a lot of things that were mentioned now was also coming up in our conversation on data and evidence. Um, we focused first on investment questions and then on the actual data gaps and needs. Um, so, for example, there was also a lot of talk about how there was data available on a country level, but not on an intervention level. That, so there was gaps there. Um, there was talking about uh, consumer demand side uh, discussions and, in, you know, educating capacity building, but also in creating the demand as such at all. Um, looking also into what kind of data, you know, how far, how broad do we want the data to be, but in how much detail do, does it go so that it, we can really help make and shape investors' decisions. Um, so one of the big things that came up again and again was that we should actually look at also at data on a more intersectional nexus part of level because there was there is data on agriculture and there's some data on energy, but they don't mix. And so they don't come together in a sense that then uh, would help us in convince investors to start funding these kinds of interventions. Um, there is also, uh, you know, also, you know, bringing these two conversations together and at the same time, just to make it even more complicated, translating it into the language that investors speak, which is basically where is the return of investment? Where is my risk? How can I de-risk? How does this work in the future? How can this market develop? How can we look at what we are what is happening right now in terms of renewable energy in the supply chains, in the value chains, and how can this translate in the next 10 years? What does it mean? How can I really, if I put my money in, how can I get the money back? Um, yes, and then yes, a lot of as consumer education and changing of demand, in providing the clear information also in what in the sense of if I am a um, farmer, how do I? How much do I? Am I willing to invest uh, in a certain solution? Um, how can I pay back? How does that that work? So also in sense of who's the end user and how is they are they involved in the decision making process? Um, Yes, uh, one big thing that came up is uh, in terms of data gaps is there's uh, a lot of agriculture work is still happening in, a, in an informal sector. So it's really tough to get the kind of information you need and the data. Um, often, if you have it, if you have it on a household level, but not so much on a productive use level. Um, there is, uh, and we all know this, it shouldn't be a surprise, a lot of the private sector um, provisioners do have data, but they don't share it uh, quite freely, which is understandable, obviously. It's, it's an in part of their investment. And uh, so we need to figure out how can we access this and how can we at least access the data that is there for larger donors or, or investors on a, an international financing, for example. Um, and then if, uh, if we look at the data that we do have, it's often not regularly updated so you would have data and then there's long gaps between you when you get the next data and a lot of things a lot of things happen so uh, one example was that there was data from 2011 on a certain value chain but since then there's been several floods and earthquakes and so the data makes no sense anymore at the moment um, and then so it's basically become more granular to really have the impact and final point was also as we we're talking about data is 
um, the moral aspect. I think Mark had also the moral aspects in his conversations. Um, you know, who owns the data? What do I do with it? What, how do I influence decision making? Uh, the whole question about privacy and, and, and consumer protection is, um, was the final comment um, that I'd like to make. Wow, awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I think we just have a minute to conclude. I would have loved for to hear uh, comments from you all to, to what you've heard. Uh, but perhaps just uh, what is coming across very clearly to me is uh, we're all agreeing that this is the right discussion and having this kind of integrated uh, approaches that bring together uh, different stakeholders representing the different interest groups between agriculture, energy and industry is, uh, is very very uh, helpful, uh, more harmonized approaches uh, that are needed, stronger coordination between agencies, donors, uh, getting uh, to the right level of data and uh, uh, working on improving data that would help uh, investors, uh, bringing the private sector on board. And I think the most important, uh, I guess, here is also um, working more on uh, where the demand is and how do we create that uh, demand and, and respond to the um, needs of the end users. Uh, quite a lot of food for thought that you've all given us here today and also a uh, big thanks to all the speakers that joined the breakout uh, sessions. Uh, we will uh, produce the summary report and uh, later on as well the videos of these uh, sessions will be available on the VEF virtual series uh, YouTube channel so uh, you could also uh, view the discussions that happened in different groups. I'd just like to thank you all once again and uh, wish you all a great afternoon. The networking uh, is going to be open for those of you that wish to stay and uh, talk to other speakers or also to some of the uh, participants that have been listening to the session and look forward to seeing you at another uh, session of the VEF virtual series. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.